Hello, everybody. I believe it is time to get started. So let's chat a little bit before we jump into things formally. So we have a lot to cover. This is going to be split into at least two videos. But we'll gauge ourselves as we go through this. So to give context, there is a massive, massive, massive document we're going to be going over. And we are going to do our best to get through it. Welcome, Dango. Welcome, Murphy. So if you have any comments, if you feel something is missing from the list as we go through uh, these sections, feel free to speak in the chat. Uh, but just be aware we'll be using a special scene, as I want the focus to be both what's written and also some of the images for the weapons and such. Let's go to the proper scene now. So welcome to the Rags to Riches Guide. This is something that has taken a very long time to go through. I'm sure there is a lot of stuff that I've missed when it comes to the tips. So definitely check out the Google document, which will be provided as a link below by the time this goes out on YouTube. Otherwise, it is currently available on my Discord. So let's go over the intent of this guide. So a lot of people have been asking, what do I do when I get to ultimate? How do I climb in ultimate? What kind of hunt should I be doing? So we're going to attempt to answer those questions. Those questions seem simple in terms of the complexity of the ask, but as we go through this, <laughs> you'll see there's going to be uh, a lot to cover. So let's start by going through, uh, I guess, some ways to potentially move your way forward from a self-found perspective. We'll have a separate guide for trading that will not be covered as part of this guide. And hopefully some of this will be new, either refreshing memory for veteran players or will be brand new to existing players and hopefully they'll find it useful. So we're going to start with the first section. Help, I feel stuck slash underpowered. PSO is kind of interesting in the sense that there are multiple level requirements, especially in the earlier versions of PSO Blue Burst, that required you to be either 90, 100, or 110 in order to enter episodes 1, 2, and 4, respectively. So there is no shame as a first-time player of really struggling to clear things uh, with a fresh character with no other stuff uh, other than what you've climbed to very hard with going into places like Forest and Temple. It happens to everybody. So relax. The answers, hopefully, will be a little bit here. So my advice, if you're looking to climb specifically out of, don't mind me typing over that. If you're looking to specifically start to climb out of that really early 80 to 90 territory, honestly, more often than not, the answer is go back to very hard mode. But let, let's go episode by episode and talk about why these things are useful to do. So I think the number one thing that people should do the moment they're able to enter ultimate, test this out. Test your gear by trying just the first few rooms leading to Dragon in a quest known as Towards the Future. There are a lot of easy chest pickups on the right side of the first room. There are mostly manageable spawn counts. As long as you know to kill the Hilda Bear to proceed to the next room, it's honestly small enemy counts leading directly into the boss. So these enemies potentially will be dropping a lot of your common level 15 techniques. So if you're playing as that Ramar humar combo, you will probably end up with the best possible buff that you could get without needing to do any kind of crazy quests. So just doing this to level will end up taking you pretty far. Now, we're going to talk about two things in tandem. There's a quest called Phantasmal World 3, which is probably the end-all, be-all Vox run for money and high-level techniques. So if you are a Force character, this is the thing that you need to be doing almost as soon as you get into Ultimate at some point. And in order to do that, in order to clear this very simple run, you need a source of hell. So it's very easy for forces to do this, but rangers and hunters also benefit from doing a quest in episode 4, known as the Restless Lion. The intent being that the Restless Lion is one of the few quests that gives guaranteed items and their commons, and they have hit percentage. 
So what does that mean? Complete it just a handful of times, and it's very likely you'll get a handgun with at least 30% hit, because that's as high as it could go in very hard mode. I believe 50% is the cap for ultimate. And suddenly, you're able to do Phantasmal World 3. Now, you can get away with it by stacking god techniques, and we'll talk about that a little later, uh, probably in a different part of this video. But essentially, with very minimal investment, less than 20 kills, in fact, less than, less than 12 kills if you do the run correctly, uh, you'll be able to pick up a lot of high-end armors, a lot of super strong weapons, decent chances of things of box rares, and not to mention a lot of money. Especially if you're coming out of the territory of very hard into ultimate. If you've been mag feeding, you're probably near broke. <laughs> if you've been combining that with charge and this is your first time character, you're probably also near broke. So if you're wondering how people get money, this is one of the many ways to do it. And this is one of the many ways that also is very easy to do the moment you get into ultimate with just a teeny tiny little bit of prep. And it leads to a lot of rewards later down the line. Now, I'm going to recommend two additional quests for Episode 4, because as I like to state pretty much every time we talk about Episode 4, Episode 4 is crazy broken. So if you want a lot of easy XP in a more quest format versus just dragon resetting over and over, there's a solo quest known as Warrior's Pride, where essentially you are paired up with a, I believe it's a Ramar and a Humar, and they're basically healable teammates that body block for you, do minor bits of damage, but more importantly, just output more DPS. So if you're looking for an alternate way to just kind of climb and do some surface rares, which we'll talk about later, this is probably a pretty solid quest to get into. And finally, we have maximum attack, fourth stage. It's a little confusing. There's A, B, C. I don't recommend the random one. If I'm talking about this one, it technically 4R also technically goes into this, but I want to focus on specifically 4B. So the difference between the A, the B, the C, and the random is basically the first section of this quest will be the same for all of those parts, except once you get past the first warp, it'll change. So I would recommend for players to, that are just entering ultimate and cannot kill anything at all to spook the Rappy waves. The Rappies uh, don't need you to actually kill them to drop items, you just have to hit them after they start to rise. So if you go pretty much max distance, shoot them, shoot them again, you will get easy access to medium level techs. So you're probably gonna get into your like level 20s. You're gonna get into, you know, ones that are a little easier to jump into than possibly like level 28s from Phantasmal World 3. And more importantly, it gives a whole bunch of weapons, a whole bunch of materials, a whole bunch of scape dolls, a whole bunch of money, a whole bunch of rare chances. And funny enough, this quest is so powerful that if you were to do this specifically for B, which has a higher density of zoos, which are giant flying birds, you can also get tickets. I'm not going to go into super details with those. Please look at the popper guide. We talk about that in great, great detail, what you can purchase with those or what you can attain with those tickets. But just know the amount of rares you can get from the very hard 4B is so powerful that people, even when they're like level 160 to 200, will still do this run for money. They will still still do that run for rares. They will still do that run for leveling up other characters. For example, if you're partying with weaker people and looking to carry as a force. I cannot stress enough how helpful that quest is. Regardless if you play it on ultimate for spooking the Rappies or just clearing 4B repeatedly. I feel like you will get a lot out of it. So what do you do as you're starting to get money, get get your feet wet, as it were, with a little bit of ultimate? And honestly, I, I, <laughs> I know it might come off the wrong way, but a lot of it comes down to fundamentals and mechanics. There are a lot of things you could do as a player where even with very basic gear, no rare weapons, you can really outperform other people with low-end rares by just really taking the time to set up your character correctly. So I'm going to go through each of these points and we'll, I think, go into more class-specific information. But I highly recommend you follow these as it is a big quality of life whenever you're doing clears. Number one, 
Do not put items in the central slot of your confirm menu. Do not put important things in your control menu. It's a habit, I would say, especially for people coming from the console version where there was no concept of zero to nine skills. PC version, there's no reason to do it. The reason why this is bad and why I recommend you don't do this is number one, if you happen to be in a quest with a very high item drop density, which is most quests that you should be running as you get further and further into ultimate, you will find yourself picking up items instead of attacking. This can lead to drop combos, this can lead to you getting hit, this could lead to you getting killed. Similarly, if you are really dependent on holding control or the equivalency thereof to swap the action palette, and you get a mag blast, which is very common as you're playing through the game and taking a lot of damage and learning about where to stand and positioning and things like that, you will waste a lot of photon blast that way. So I would recommend as alternatives in particular for healing uh, to get used to assigning them potentially to your zero to nine. So those include things not only just Resta or Monomates or Crimates or whatever your equivalency is, but also put your soul atomizers there. Please put some basic things that you don't want a menu for that you need to be able to access as fast as possible, such as potentially your buffs and debuffs. And you will go much further. So I'm going to give you an example of like the most common time loss that I see whenever we play on ultimate is whenever somebody gets slowed and they're fighting falls in ultimate as an example, and the boss slows you. I will watch people come to a dead stop, spend about three or four seconds going through their menu, then they hit Soul Animizer, then they start moving. They are missing between three to five entire attack chains with bad menuing. So by just assigning it to zero to nine, you are suddenly able to react to things so much faster than if you were to go through the menu. Now there are reasons you might use menus to go through quickly, and that's why I recommend getting comfortable with the Technique menu and the Equipment menu mid-battle. Now the reason you want to use the Equipment menu mid-battle, one, it's less button presses to go through. Two, if you're used to using the Quick menu in order to rapidly heal yourself and you weapon swap, you're inevitably going to cause a user error. So at some point you will mess up the menuing because you will forget that you were on the item menu, or you will forget if you were on the weapon menu. So if you constantly go through the equipment menu, which again, potentially saves steps depending on where it is, it's going to remove that potential error, it's going to remove you getting hit, it's going to remove you being put in a bad situation. Similarly, with the technique menu, there are times where there is a very low pressure in order to chain techniques as fast as possible, now, while I would recommend setting up the quick menu to do that with, uh, for example, your Gazond as your first option, you could use the equivalency of tab to resort your techniques in the order that you like, but having quick access to things like Gazond, Rafoe, even to some extent uh, Rabarda and Gifoe, uh, being able to chain those with no frames in between, meaning if you hit it early, it's gonna buffer it until the frame that you are no longer casting and then cast it. You will end up just out DPSing anybody that's doing it manually pretty much every time. So if you get comfortable with the combination of the technique menu for casting spells in low pressure scenarios where you just repeatedly just mash A to <laughs> completely do it, great examples of that is versus bosses like Bolt Op where generally they're not attacking very often or if you're quick menuing things like Rabarda versus Rafoe versus these things where the technique menu might be a little slower because they're on different uh, technique levels, for example. Learning to test those and use those in your casual gameplay will save you so much time, not healing, and also potentially killing enemies before they even get to hit you. In fact, a lot of the later game setups in Ultimate involve you basically being able to stun lock with techniques and this allows you to do it much easier in particular with female characters than if you were to do it manually 
So one additional thing I will say where it's okay to uh, use the quick menu for healing versus keeping it on one menu all the time as you play is if you do buffer, for example, if you excuse me, if you do use an item that way, like a die made, a try made, a star atomizer, and use it early, it'll use it the frame that you stand up. So some limited scenarios that's okay to do, but generally speaking, if you're in a low pressure environment, you should just be using the number keys to heal. In addition, if you use it on your zero to nine, you can heal during boss cutscenes or any cutscenes in general where you still potentially have character control. This is important to save time both in runs, but also allows you to basically get set up between waves. So sometimes, for example, a boss might strike you down and you'll fall flat on your butt, but the boss fight will move into another phase. And during that time, you're actually able to move around. So if you've assigned your buffs, your healing, and everything else, you could just basically go into the next phase, get free healing, buff your entire party, and you're good to go. And that just opens it up by just having it on 0-9 to nine rather than the quick menu. There's a lot of different ways that you could use this. I'm hoping that I'm probably only touching a few, but I cannot stress how important it is to start exploring these alternatives as you climb, as they will make you a lot stronger of a player, even with very basic gear. One thing I want to mention specifically though, uh, when it comes to 0-9 to nine mapping, some people are not even aware, in fact I wasn't aware the first, I would say, year and a half that I played, that there's an alternate 0-9 to nine that you can reach in the customized menu. So normally you have access to the action palette and then the flip of the action palette. So if you go into the flip of the action palette, you can, you can assign a completely different set of 10 abilities. So for most characters, 20 different commands you have on the fly, no matter what the situation, means you are pretty much never going to be locked out by Photon Blasts. And on top of that, you're going to have flexibility of really fast tri fluids for characters that care about TP. You're going to have quick access to traps, healing, moon atomizers, telepipes, everything. You're basically just eliminating menuing, and you're just making it very easy for yourself. Murphy in the chat saying, I've done that stand up and get movement thing with falls a lot. Exactly. I would say that probably happens the most with um, probably phases of falls, just because there's so many of them. But it also happens a lot in the episode 4 boss in general. It's very easy to get struck as you're moving between phases. So again, that just saves you time, it lets you get into position. It's just so much easier to do, knowing that if you put it on the 0-9, to nine, you suddenly can do things other players can't, just because you put it there. So one thing I wanted to mention also, which uh, is a quality of life feature specific to Affinia, in the older versions of Blue Burst, if you got Photon Blast, it used to lock you out of the control 0-9. to nine. It no longer does that as of, I want to say, end of 2023. So this is a huge quality of life change, where basically you have 20 commands on demand, and you barely, barely, rarely ever need to use your action panels for things like that. So definitely a big quality of life change I wanted to point out for Affinia in particular. So I talk about a little bit here with the rapid tech usage. But um, I think the best example to give is I did a comparative video maybe about a, a few months ago where I did a run of episode four in particular where Gafoe stacking is king. Those that don't know what I mean by that, <laughs> we're, we're gonna go into a lot of details there in a bit. But essentially the amount of spells I can pump out at once, I was seeing a difference on average per room of one to two lingering fireballs. So for example, just a hypothetical scenario, if every fireball does 500 damage, and an enemy can be hit by as many Gafoes that are currently in the room, I was seeing on average a damage difference of instead of potentially only doing 1500, or maybe at best 2000 damage, a very consistent 2500 to sometimes the rare 3000 damage. And that's all without a change in equipment, and that is purely due to the way that I was fast casting techs. So if you hear me later in the video talking about how forces are king in episode 4, I am abusing the fact that these fast casts through either the technique menu of F3 or the quick menu set up so that you have access to a lot of easy techs, including things like Foey potentially for falls as an example, uh, really, really up your DPS. I cannot stress how much damage you're leaving on the table by not doing this. I almost guarantee you, you will see a very big difference because it just adds a lot of consistency. And on top of that, 
the ability to just rapid chain them opens up a lot of stun locks before you get additional items that help you with that, in particular for the male forces. And for female forces, I feel like this is, again, very vital to do this in order to get consistent stun locks, as they sometimes still have trouble with it, even with some of their other boosts. So one additional thing I'm going to add here, this is more of a general tip. Uh, for people that aren't aware, this is something I'm going to tell them. Opening a quick menu, or any of your function menus, or hitting the start menu equivalency, avoids you targeting. You want to do this not only for dodging traps in hallways, so if you're wondering how people go through those lines of traps in like episode 1, episode 2, you're doing one of these things in order to avoid the target. But this is also pretty important when you're looking to dodge, so I feel like a lot of people don't do this, and they kind of forget about this. So let's say an enemy is really close to you, and they're about to smack you in the face. You do not want to be targeting when you're running past things. You targeting slows you down, forces you to run further, and in some scenarios causes you to not be able to punish properly. So I recommend just using the menu whenever you're looking to just purely walk. I like for aesthetic reasons the quick menu to be open, because I like to just see the full screen without the actual play window <laughs> shrinking down. There's there's nothing wrong with hitting the pause menu, it works just as well. Uh, but I've been switching to the quick menu because I like to see full field of vision. You can also do this technically while you're in towns or walking by switches or talking to NPCs in certain quests. And again, some of that is just quality of life, just making it so that you go faster in these rooms. But other times it also avoids scenarios where you slow down and you get hit by something you normally would have dodged. Murphy in the chat saying, for Gafoli in particular, it only stays a couple seconds per wave, but it makes every wave so much more consistent and safe. Exactly. So th the difference of pumping out the one to two additional Gafoli, again, it might, it maybe if you're really on point, you don't see like a massive difference most of the time, but I guarantee you, you will see very often, more often than not, uh, the ability to stack your spells or stun lock is just so ultra consistent between using things like Gazond or even just Gafoe preventing enemies from ever reaching you. That can be really bad, and particularly if you're not used to the animation to look for uh, when you're at the end of your Gafoe, where people just kind of mash it without any timing in general, uh, you will notice a big difference there. Uh, one other small tip before we go into the more class specific information uh, would be that make sure not to mag blast uh, in between spawns or in poison rooms. The reason being that uh, if you do that, let's say you mag blast as the last enemy is killed, if more enemies come in, they will not be frozen by the time stop effect of the mag blast and you will usually die. Similarly, if you do it in a poison room, or like a heat room, or any room that damages you by existing in it, it will me melt you, and you will probably die. Murphy's saying, this is the only difference with a single force, with multiple forces is so much stronger. Exactly. Exactly. Welcome in Parameter. Uh, one other very small tip that I also would include here for people that are sorting the quick menu, or not sorting the quick menu, for sorting the inventory, so if you're in the items and you hit sort, one thing I think people uh, kind of sleep on, I, I always mess this up and I need to get better at it too, is whatever weapon you were holding at the time will always be at the top of the list. So if you are swapping between two really crucial items, let's say uh, maybe it's your Hell weapon, your Charge, your Berserk, and the rest of your items, if you need to be able to rapidly swap between two weapons, in order to get consistency, especially with common weapons where their sword order might be very odd compared to the other things, just hold one of the weapons to make sure it's first. So for example, if I know a boss will repeatedly want me to swap back and forth between two weapons, like Falls is a really great example for that, I will generally put whatever my ult boss weapon is in hand at the time, and know that if I'm ever swapping into the other scenarios I'd use it, it's now in a consistent order for me. So if you're wondering why sometimes the sort looks a little weird, or ways you could potentially manipulate the sort to be more advantageous, just keep in mind it checks what items you're holding when you go to use the sort. So let's talk about class efficiency. So I, I'm gonna stress this. This is more. This is semi pet peeve. This is also just somewhat true in general. Male barehanded casting is superior to almost every option unless the thing you are holding directly grants you a damage bonus. 
do not be the person that casts full like a Bowie chains with Blight Divine. Please do not do this. <laughs> In fact, there are weapon types that are very slow. So for example, the Rod weapon type is much slower on most characters, even comparison to Wands, and is hilariously slow compared to barehanded casting. So honestly, it's a little weird to say, but the male forces best best held weapon quote unquote is their fist like just unequip them if you do not have the thing that buffs it like you don't have the elemental wands or you find yourself you know playing more of a support role and then you want to dps just unequip your weapon i cannot stress how much damage you lose by doing this it if you combine that also with the ability to basically rapid cast you are you are legitimately losing like two to three gafoes of damage. Like it just holding it is like one less gafoe per like three gafoes. It's kind of insane. So honestly, just make sure to unequip the support weapons when you're doing those kinds of things. Now there are some runs where it's less needed. Like for example, if you are really literally never doing damage, that's one thing. But more often than not, uh, PSO is about being able to provide support either through demons or insta kill or any or paralysis or something that makes damaging a lot better yeah rod is extremely slow like you're losing i think upwards of like 11 frames check and frame check me on that there is a chart in affinia i just don't have it open at the moment uh but it it really adds up over time it is really really bad and just by holding those weapons you also can't stun lock Whereas if you're barehand casting, you're going to be able to stun lock as the male forces immediately in ultimate. Whereas other characters like the females can't without assistance. So I'm, I'm stressing it again. It is so important. Honestly, unequip it. That MST boost from whatever you have, pointless. Put it away. <laughs> you're literally nerfing yourself. Be free. I will also note that uh, if you do have a weapon with the fist animation, that is also okay to keep. So for example, if you have, uh, what's it called? If you have something like Angry Fist on, that's okay to wear, since it uses the unarmed animation. I'm gonna put a little parentheses. Or weapons with fist attack animation. Just for clarity. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no. I want to see... Without V801, it's it's terrible. I, isn't it seven... I thought it was seven frames without V801. It's pretty bad. But as I said before, it really adds up. Um, it's, it's really not good to do. That's enough to lose the stun lock, for sure. Okay, so stressing this again, always buff your allies, but always be doing something else in between for DPS slash clears. This could be things like debuffs. This could be things like demons, hell... Um, honestly, or even just stacking stacking certain spells, or even trying to get like a gimmick freeze, it's better than doing nothing due to the fact that damage cancelling is no longer a thing in Affinia. You don't have to worry about accidentally reducing people's damage in this version. So one little caveat though for debuffs, which I do want to point out, is that while they are extremely good to use in single player, uh, in like 95% of the scenarios, um, due to the fact that there are generally not big stats on the enemies until you go to the higher areas um being able to even just debuff for example as the humar is kind of big for clears so don't don't forget to equip that if you're humar uh but the reason why it's a little scary in multiplayer is the concept of iframes so i i don't know what the term is specifically so forgive me for not quoting it directly uh but essentially there is a equivalency of a grace period where after you get hit there is x amount of frames between your standing, or for, between your rising and standing animation, or if you're still standing, how quickly you could take another hit again. And in multiplayer, that number is very low. So you will see in some scenarios versus very dangerous enemies, and we'll talk about those in great detail in a little bit, uh, where debuffing them can actually lead to a lot of problems with you. So there are certain enemies you should never, ever, ever gel in, and we will go through some of those. But just be aware, if an enemy very rapidly hits, they might be a bad target to gel in if it causes your allies to stay standing rather than get knocked down. 
Now that's kind of a case-by-case -case scenario, and obviously as you get towards really endgame PSO, the exact scenarios you need to do it are a little different. <laughs> I've trolled to give you times to gel up bosses. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that is 100% sure. Yeah. That's a good point to mention that uh, PSO is based off the 30 frames per second. So even just losing like 4 to 7 frames, like you're losing almost a third of a second just by equipping those items. It's like, it's crazy. Just don't do it. It's so bad. Uh, but da -da 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 -da. Okay. So I, I, I just put this here, but I'll, repeating, I'll be repeating this quite a few times throughout. So Gafoli, no matter what level it is, can be used to stop charging enemies. We'll talk about what enemies that stops in great detail in a little bit. But I'm going to put it here to emphasize that even if spells don't really do damage, they can be useful. Uh, actually, I want to make sure I mentioned Rebarda in here. I don't think I did. I'm going to say Rebarda can be used to hit certain enemies. Um, to put them in vulnerable animations. And I'll give an example of Del Saber. And is useful to use regardless of damage dealt. So I'll go into more detail with this in the appropriate sections, but I feel like I should probably add this here if I'm going to add Gifoe there. Um, one thing you do, do need to be aware of, though, specifically with Rebarda, is that uh, if you freeze them like the first couple of frames that they're available to you, because of latency between players, you could cause targets, you could cause the enemies to become untargetable. So I'm going to try to warn you when this can happen, but just be aware it's better to not hit them frame one with things that potentially damage, uh, or excuse me, that potentially freeze or potentially paralyze, because you can leave your party unable to uh, deal with them. I'm putting a reminder in here that casts get a bonus to uh, Paralysis, Confuse, Freeze, and Ultimate at the cost of Worst Demon's Efficiency. I don't know if they're ever going to rebuff Freeze. It's technically a little better than what it was in vanilla, but it's not anywhere near as strong as it was a couple years ago. So you'll see me generally not basically praise the, the abilities of Freeze until they change this. So keep an eye out on it. Maybe we'll do an update if that ever becomes important again. So one thing to be aware of and to get used to, especially if you've been playing through normal to very hard, as you're climbing, there are a lot of times where it's just better not to finish a combo for safety reasons. So for example, you might be doing a combination of normal heavies or normal normal, or even heavy heavy, depending on who the character is, in order to basically push them back. But if you complete the combo, you're not gonna have enough time due to the pause after your attack in order to dodge some melee swings. So, Ultimate starts to introduce a lot of really fast enemies in multiplayer, and even in general, you're not going to be able to kill them as you first come into the game at level 80, and on top of that, they hit for a lot of damage. So you really have to learn to play safe uh, if you're playing Hunter, but if you're playing Ranger, you're just cheating. You just, you just win. Or if he's saying freeze items have to compete with freeze traps and frozen shooter, indeed. Yeah, we'll be talking about some of those uses for sure. Uh, I actually don't think I put full things on traps. We'll actually expand the guide in real time. But anyway, uh... Da -da 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 -da. Yeah, so I, I want you to experiment the bare minimum movement needed to bait a swing from an enemy and still dodge. ESO Ultimate is all about refinement of the basic mechanics. So knowing the, you know, quote-unquote weak side of an enemy, like where it's easier to dodge a strike, depending on what arm they're raising, makes a really big difference in your level of play. And this alone can already make you clear ultimate if you have not been practicing this before. Uh, one additional thing I just want people to be aware of is that in if you happen to get in a high-level game, just be aware that there are people that really micromanage their HP doesn't happen all the time, but just be aware that this can happen in particular with hunters that are looking to micromanage their exact HP and get hit by set damage. So for example, if they have a mag with really strong base invincibility and they know that an enemy is going to do 700 damage and they know that will put them under 10% health, 
they're probably fishing for the invincibility. Or let's say they have a giant sword known as Dark Flow, which we'll talk about in probably the second or third part of the guide. Uh, where essentially you need to be low health in order to use it. So if you are joining high level games, just make sure to ask and double check if they're looking to do these things. It's just better to ask. I don't think most people will get very upset at you for healing. In fact, some people will like it because it saves, you know, needing to monomate or dimate or trimate in particular for casts. But just be aware that that can be a thing. It's, I, I don't think this is really a thing in very hard mode, but in ultimate and beyond, you can see a lot of people do that. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about traps, I guess. So one thing that uh, people should learn to do is that if you deploy a trap, so let's say you use your zero to nine keys, and then you immediately attack, you will hit the trap instantly. This is extremely useful. For freeze traps. So for example, while there are certain spawns you can time to auto detonate, so that way you don't waste an attack, being able to instantly freeze or instantly... Uh, I'll actually say confuse. Dude, there's some scenarios you want to do this. Being able to instantly trigger the trap and not needing to wait like 5 to 8 seconds is the difference between your party getting completely devastated and completely shutting down an encounter. Learning to time this is really good. You can do it with things like mech guns. The timing's a little different. And it's, it's generally recommended you stick to handguns and rifles for that scenario. Be aware that there are some multi-hit weapons where they don't consistently hit the trap for whatever reason. I know offhand last one is super jank, even though it's a handgun, because it fires the three bullets and sometimes all three bullets will hit the trap and not do anything. So just be aware that if it generally has a lot of shots, there's usually a little trick to get them to work, and those will require a bit more practice. I would say early on, if you're climbing, the most useful trap is ironically not the freeze trap. It's probably the confuse trap. So the reason why I want to push confuse traps, at least for the early portions of ultimate, is just because of the concept where you just don't have the damage. Like there's a big difference between like a 1600 ATP hue cast with charge Vulcan using a f like using traps versus like a 850 ATP. <laughs> in the same scenario where there's a lot of times where if you're in an area that's definitely harder than your damage capacity confuse trap is just gonna honestly out dps whatever you could do so respect the confuse trap they become a little less useful as you climb in particular since high end gear will generally let you one shot or one combo excuse me slash combo kill most enemies but do not sleep on this there's a lot of scenarios where I have seen people play Hue Cast and Raw Cast and just never use their Confuse Traps. And I feel so sad, chat, every time. It's free damage. <laughs> you might as well as do it. It makes you, it's like less safe than Freeze and not as useful as Freeze once you get things like Paralysis, where you're looking to land a lot of specials. But man, it does it help out in general. I'm actually going to put fire traps here as well. I think another thing that people sleep on, in particular with Del Saber, is if there's enemies that react to being hit, fire traps can often trigger that, and then you could continuously run away from them. So if you're looking to save, a, you know, trap potential on Del Sabers and things like that, and save it for other things in ruins, uh, that is also pretty useful to know. I don't think I have a section for fire traps. Let me add it here. I think I talk about it down below. Uh, they can also be used for slime duping slash instant slime kills. See below slime strats. I'm not going to go into detail here. We talk about this much later on. So one big use of the fire trap that I feel like a lot of people also sleep on. It is really crucial, especially as you're leveling, to be able to combo kill. So what do I mean by that? So 
you never want to be in a scenario where if you are committing to the third hit of a combo, the target does not die. And I feel like people that are not really paying attention to fire weakness, or even just looking at how far off they are in terms of damage dealt, are ending up in scenarios where they get hit, where if they just fire trapped at the beginning of their combo, which again doesn't have an animation, like it doesn't force you in an animation kind of thing, uh, that you suddenly just drop kills. And I feel like I, I, I would recommend when we go over uh, fire techs later on to definitely just kind of study up on this. But more often than not, it can stop them from hitting you. Like, just offhand examples, other than stopping Del Savers, it stunlocks the lizard enemies, it stops Babudas from firing fireballs. Like, even if it doesn't do a lot of damage, hitting them out of attack animation is so huge. Aether Trips is carrying the PSL community, maybe. Fire traps are really good. I feel like these are slept on, and I feel like a lot of people don't know the slime strats, and we will talk about that in greater detail. I might reorganize some of this data by the time you see a link to it again, but I think all the points are still here, so we'll, we'll leave it as is for now. I'm not going to get hung up on it. Um, the final thing I want to make sure that you're doing, no matter how far you are in ultimate, level alternate mags. Please level more than one mag, I beg of you. I've seen so many people make the mistake of leveling one mag all the way to ultimate and then not having the right mags for other scenarios. So what do I mean by that? So one, if you're going through and playing, let's say like a raw moral or you're playing a hue neural or you're playing any character with a mix of ATP and MST, potentially also forces since you will be expected to do a lot of ATP as a force later on. If you are not feeding a mag basically near constantly, and ideally feeding more than one at once, so you're feeding, making basically duplicates of them, you are going to make alt characters way harder to level than they should be. You're not going to be ready for episode 2, where we talk about it in the popper guide. There are entire situations where you basically give up things like MST for ATP, or get like really good accuracy for your other characters. You give that up by just choosing not to make another mag, so I cannot stress to you how important it is to continue to level a mag. Like, your first mag, no matter how bad it is, at least it's stats. But when you start getting access to more consistent cell parts, or things like dragon scales, that's when you commit to, like, the true endgame mag. So I'm just gonna stress it, we talk about that in the popper guide. Please look again at the popper guide for the breakdown of the min-max stats for those mags. But I cannot stress to you how big of a mistake it is to not have something like a mind mag for all your human characters to instantly learn level 15 and 20 techniques once you're able to get them by just doing the basic area of ultimate forest. Like, you are making it so much harder on yourself and you are literally delaying your own progress. So please, if you're not in ultimate yet or you just started to go into ultimate and you realize, oops, I have no mind score because I'm going ATP only, uh, definitely think about that. <laughs> And it's okay to have, like, uh, you know, something you have as you level versus your endgame stats. Like, the thing you have as you level doesn't have to be perfect. So don't don't stress if you quote-unquote mess up the mag. It's Unless it's, like, horrendously, horrendously wrong, like you're missing all mag blasts or something crazy, uh, it's generally workable. Stats are, like, the first and foremost most important thing for doing damage in this game. So between having things like materials and levels, that's going to make your playthrough of other characters so much easier. So now we're going to talk a little bit about difficulty. Now I, I expect this to be a little bit of a hot take to some extent, and I'm sure people will rate things a little differently. But I tried to break down ultimate for both the ATP and MST approach into three major categories. Because I want you to understand of like where you potentially should be going early and this should be in the exact order that i recommend yeah like unless you put unless you have like a hundred defense mag or something crazy if you've been leveling some combination of power mind and dex you're fine like it doesn't matter if you have six defense no one cares <laughs> like i'm telling you no one cares it's fine you could fix it much later uh but one thing i just want to kind of point out uh in particular for like atp versus mst clears generally speaking when it comes to things like forest, caves, and temple, these are kind of like your 
beginner areas. There, it's pretty consistent. You don't need like a crazy amount of levels. I recommend Temple kind of like at the tail end of early game. It's not something I would dive into first. And we'll talk about when we go to the item portion of it. But just in terms of the enemies you face in forests, they're mostly fairly easy. Uh, caves is a little riskier, depending on how much uh, dark resist you have. And again, we'll cover that in more details. But just know in general, these are your starting areas. We're going to prefer you start in forest most of the time for all IDs. Now, mid game is kind of, this is probably the most objective. I don't think most people will disagree with end game. So what do I mean by mid game? There is a difference between the single player and multiplayer of each of these areas. And we're gonna go through each of these areas in great detail. But I want you to know, and I think this is the one that throws people off the most, I think multiplayer mines is the hardest thing you could do outside of CCA, Underground, Seabed, and Tower. I feel like this is the new player killer. It is horrible. I, I would rather do almost anything else in a low level party than mines. Mines is like insufferably terrible for reasons we're going to go into more detail in a little bit. So I do feel like it's important to note that there's a big difference between playing it single player and multiplayer. I don't feel like that really was the case in very hard mode. Like however hard it was for you in single player is about how hard it is in multiplayer. That is really not the case in multiplayer. And a lot of that has to do with something I mentioned before earlier with the lack of iframes. So enemies that would only maybe hit you once in a combo suddenly hit twice. And that twice damage is also like 1.4 times more than before. So instead of taking like 400 damage, you're taking 1200 damage in the same room from the same combo. It's crazy. It's actually crazy. <laughs> so if you're looking for a rough order, this is what I recommend from an ATP perspective. And I get, again, I expect people to have, be like, oh no, why'd you put jungle before ruins, blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna go look. My rule of thumb for these three is as long as you are not fighting murder flowers, they are easier than trying to complete the last fullers of ruins. I think the beginning of ruins is definitely easier. So you'll see you'll see me recommend a lot of these runs when we go into the items in the next part. End game is end game. I, I don't think I really have to explain it. If you've ever played in it very hard, you'll understand it's a big mistake. And then it's just ridiculous. Hello, Key says you're making me want to start playing again. Well, that's good. <laughs> but we're going to talk about MST. So I want to draw some differences between the two and why some of these are really hard. Maybe this is a hot take. I think episode four can be done almost earlier than every single area or the force. Forces are really good at episode four. I think a big issue is that, as you'll see in our breakdown after this section, there are a lot of scenarios where enemy resists just go out of control. Like, they are just bonkers, stupid, and I don't know why they're like that other than hate on the player. In fact, I'm going to bring up a very specific example. Give me one second as I load this up. Let's hide this for a second. So let's talk about the Darkbringer. <laughs> So here's just one example of many. I'm just going to draw briefly attention to the thing stats over here. So it's got 30 ice resists in single player, 2,700 health. You're like, okay, you know, 30, 30 resistance is pretty low for ultimate. What's wrong with that? Why don't we see what it looks like on multiplayer, aka normal mode? Oops, it has 90 resist. <laughs> you are so dead. You are not killing this enemy. No, I don't want to hear anybody claim to me Ruins isn't one of the most impossible areas for forces. <laughs> it's so bad. It's so bad, chat. Like, this is so bad. This thing is like the newbie killer. This is like actual endgame. Yeah, oops, I'll resist. You're not hurting this enemy. Good luck. So there's a lot of enemies like that, and we'll, we'll break down where that happens for the most part. I think for me, that's the most infamous example of how unfair it is to forces and I feel like people need a concrete example. This is my example. An enemy gaining like 60 resistance and no longer having resistance, but doubling in health. Actually insanity. Actual insanity chat. I don't know why it's like that. It makes me very sad though. Anyway, back to the guide. <laughs> Just... So if you're wondering why chat, most of the time it has to do with horrible, horrible 
horrible resistances. But uh, let's let's continue. Yeah, it's just it's just not stuff the force can deal with. So like, episode four I feel is kind of their playground, and honestly, outside of hit point requirements. I think underground for them, which is usually the hardest area in the game, or one of the hardest areas of the game, is actually really not that bad. It's like, I, I kind of put it between mid-game and end-game, which is the end area for episode 4. The only thing that makes it hard for forces is HP. Like, honestly, this is it. Forces don't care about underground like other characters do. They don't care about, like, any of the enemy gimmicks. They don't care about anything. But anyway, with that in mind, uh, basically, the way I've kind of put it is that if something has atrociously bad resists or hilariously impossible to kill HP totals for forces, I will most likely more often than not put it in endgame. And I think, for example, Mines is endgame. Spaceship is nearly unplay unplayable for them. Mountain, Seaside, and Jungle, horrible for forces. Like, if you have Megid, it's not as bad. But if you're playing, like, if you're only playing forces and you're trying to kill, like, the giant flowers or trying to kill Gibbles with only MST, nightmare, nightmare fuel chat. You're going to be burning, like, literally two trifluids a room and barely kill anything. Like, they cannot kill any mini bosses with MST. If if you were to rule out the mini bosses, I would be willing to maybe raise this up and <laughs> how easy it is. Because there are a lot of things you can get, but the problem is they can't deal with any of the mini bosses at all. It's terrible. Um, yeah, and, and for that scenario, I think Ruins is like almost impossible for them in multiplayer. If you played Oops All Forces, it's bad. It's really bad. I actually think the clear speed is worse than the other areas. But generally speaking, if an area has a good use of solo, uh, insta-kill, and or allows you to do spell damage, I generally put them between the early and mid-game. So that, that's my philosophy, and that's more or less how I've tailored the item list, which we'll see more in the second part. But anyway, let, let's go into more specific um, discussions on an episode-by-episode -episode breakdown. As I said before, chat, I wrote a lot. Strap in. <laughs> We're not gonna see we're not gonna see the items for a while. See that scroll bar? You're not even close. But anyway, um how I view episode one. I feel like most characters in single player solo can handle every area area pretty well. Uh I would say only maybe the later areas I would prefer to do Hunter Ranger over them. And I think this in most scenarios, hunters and rangers will have an advantage of boss rush on just pure forces. Not to say forces can contribute in damage and boss rush or provide really valuable things, uh, but generally speaking, in multiplayer, uh, due to some of those unfortunate enemies existing in episode one, there are some areas where you're like, okay, I have to bring, I have to bring something to deal with them that isn't MST related. Um, I'm just noting here that generally speaking, uh, episode one is the easiest areas to clear because their stats are just lower. So you will not really need super endgame gear to clear forest. You won't really need a lot to clear caves. But the bosses might require you to have specific items. So for example, uh, dragon, you'll need like a multi-hit weapon. You know, worm boss, you might need a partisan or like a high ATP weapon. So there are things you might need, but if you're just doing regular enemy clears, you're probably fine with mostly commons, to be honest with you. And again, I'm just drawing attention to forces have a disadvantage in later areas due to the hit points and tech resist being greatly boosted without going ATP. In multiplayer, I want to stress that this is in multiplayer. In single player, I think it's mostly balanced, where you can play a force as they're intended, quote unquote, as only techs. I feel like in single player, it's fine. There's only like a couple enemies that give you a little trouble, but it isn't like... I'm spending four minutes killing something because I'm doing 100 damage to a 6,000 health enemy. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's there's a very big difference between those. I think the only mini boss forces can handle are Gibbles, and only because their weakness is ice, so they can be frozen, riddled with demons. Yeah, yeah, basically, like, the the way I also categorize ATP is if you are using demons, then it's also not as bad. So again, if I'm playing Force in Episode 2 multiplayer, and I'm doing Episode 2, I'm not playing it as an MST clear. I'm clearing it purely through specials, or I'm clearing it purely through ATP. 
I'm almost never casting a spell in some of those areas I listed as endgame. So I think that is a good point for Murphy to bring up, but I just want to be very clear. Uh, there is an expectation pretty much throughout that forces in order to do optimal damage will need melee weapons at some point, whether it's for a specific boss or to handle some of the horrible, horrible elemental resists. So let's introduce you to the idea of the meta. Again, this is not going to be like super, super in-depth when it comes to just an understanding. I just want you to know, like, what are what are ways people clear it very quickly? Forest. Um, I would recommend you bring in Cure Shock to deal with Hildebear. That enemy has a very annoying uh, shock ailment, which can cause you to basically be stunlock looped if you're fighting a lot of them. So that's a pretty easy pickup to do in Corrin's uh, gamble list, which again, if you don't know what that is, please check out the Popper Guide. We talk about all the wonderful 1k gambles you could do in order to be prepped. Uh, but be aware that I do think Force actually clears moderately well. So the Force has uh, some gimmick checks that they can do. So for example, uh, there are enemy spawns tied into the destruction of item boxes in Forest. So they're able to hit those with things like Resond through walls. And they're also able to do item checks without ever entering items. So even if technically they don't quote unquote outkill the Charged Berserk Spirit alternative, with a lot of gimmick checks, they can end up doing a lot of really fast reset runs that the other characters can't quite do, just due to the fact that they have level potentially level 30 techniques. So I thought this was important to stress because I think a lot of people ask, like, what are the actual differences between like very hard and ultimate? So every area we're going to be covering hopefully covers every single gimmick that these enemies have outside of raw stats. I don't feel like repeating they have high stats over and over again. I do want to know if some of their basic core mechanics have changed. So for example, the two wolves can now slow or paralyze you. I'm going to be honest with you though, I think I've been paralyzed and slowed by both of them a total of once in a thousand runs. The only time they really hit you during that, i found, is if I'm using Resta. If I'm attacking, or if I'm spellcasting, I don't seem to get hit by them. So, shrug shoulders. I don't normally gear up to deal with it. It very rarely, if ever, hits you. That's why I put emphasis on if, because honestly, you really shouldn't ever be hit by those. It, it takes a lot to get hit by those. Uh, the little mosquito things, the mothbirds, can now poison you, which is annoying. But again, if you just bring soul atomizers, that's usually all you need. The hill to bear causing the shock status ailment is actually pretty annoying, to the point where people will specifically itemize, and I really hope you have your equivalency of soul atomizer on your 0 to 9, because again, the longer you spend in the menu, the more time they have to prep another Gazond and, and shock you again. So again, this kind of feeds into fundamentals, help prevent some of these issues. Now, what's really funny is that they're <laughs> the upgraded or rare version of the Hilda Bear, uh, the Hilda Tor, aka the giant ape monsters. Uh, they could shoot Megid, and it's a really deadly Megid. But I'm gonna be honest with you, they almost never get this ability out. It has quite a bit of a wind up, and it's very slow. It, it very rarely comes up. So people not gear for it, just kill it. <laughs> I wrote that from my note. I just wrote, oh boy, it's an ice dragon. Yeah, the, the dragon freezes you, which is sometimes annoying. But honestly, outside of maybe your first 15 levels of ultimate, this thing will almost always die instantly in party combos. So uh, you'll get to see what it does for a little bit, but there will come a point where it no longer does anything and you no longer care. So one thing I wanted to denote here for uh, player new players in particular, I feel like if you don't play as the other classes, you don't really understand like what the strengths are technically, quote unquote, of your character and what the weaknesses are of the other characters. So for each of these sections, in particular for Hunter Ranger, I've written down uh, the, the things to kind of look for. In fact, I'm going to check one thing here before we go further. So from the standpoint of the different enemy types, most of the time, I just due to ease of access of the item, 
Most people should probably have the equivalency of what's called three seals or something that boosts Razond. And honestly, Razond is really, 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 really strong at clearing forest. Like, there are most spells do decently well in forest, but honestly, it's pretty strong there. I would say the only things that also kind of resist. Yeah, most of these don't really matter. I would say basically, if you see, uh, you know, you're forced spamming Razond a lot there to fight the Talos. Otherwise, if they're using Gafoe or Rafoe or the fire spells, you'll be fighting Hilda Bears. Almost nothing else matters, to be honest. Actually, I want to make one... Actually, no, that's fine. I make note of it here. So, one thing that to kind of note is that there are weapons you can pick up between very hard mode and ultimate, like really early ultimate. Uh, Guilty Light is something you can technically get very easily in very hard mode. Again, see Popper God. That ends up helping a lot. But there are other general weapon, weapon types that help clear or help hit the enemy early on before you're able to handle harder areas. And we're going to mention this weapon a lot, so let's let's jump ahead briefly. We'll mention it again in the next video, but I think it's extremely important to know what Frozen Shooter is before we go any further, since a lot of the strategies talk about that particular thing. Give me one second here. So we'll, we'll shortcut a little bit for the, the sake of the guide itself. Let's talk about Frozen Shooter. I'm going to leave this up very briefly. We'll go into more details when we're later on in the guide. But essentially what we're looking to do is find this gun. This weapon. This intro to Ultimate God. A little bit. We're still very much in the early parts of it. It's very easily farmed in Episode 1. It's from the literal starting enemies of the area. There's no reason to not get this gun. A lot of strategies in harder areas involve rangers getting this. There is no real way around this. This is the gun that defines the ranger and you get it really, really early. Like one of their four best weapons is a very early pickup. So I mentioned before Blizzard is mostly not worth it. If you're looking to freeze targets, you'll see people use freeze traps. So generally that's why casts are preferred in a lot of these other higher runs that we'll discuss in a moment. But be aware that there is a guaranteed always freeze as long as you hit the shot uh, weapon called Frozen Shooter. So if you hear me reference this, I'll bring it up again later, but we're going to be discussing this in great detail. So anyway, that weapon also has many special properties, one of which is if you shoot the special attack, it will infinitely hit upwards or downwards, and that allows you to hit flying targets. So that weapon kind of enables a whole bunch of runs for Ranger, and in some ways Rangers can do a lot of the quote-unquote mid-game runs early as soon as they get this weapon. Because <laughs> it is it is like that run warping for new players, I can't understate it, it is like number one priority. Your Ranger needs it, period. No exceptions. Get that item, it is really good. But for characters looking to climb with techniques, um, I do feel like... I do feel like for the most part, Razond ends up stunlocking everything. This is kind of like the universal solver. It's not necessarily the best in low density. It's just low density waves. It's not exactly the best in every single room, but anytime there's a Hilda Bear mixed with any other enemy type, Razond and getting buffs towards that technique mean that you could chip out the whole room really quickly. The only enemy you can't really deal with at all with Razond is Tallow. Rappies also technically give a little bit of an issue, but you can just spook them with Razond, depending on where you're standing. That's why I don't really see them as a big issue, to be honest. Uh, knowing Gazan can hit the dragon and is preferred. Uh, I'll say wall grounded, wall grounded and flying is knowing that uh, there are enemies with multiple parts, so if you haven't been doing this in the lower difficulties, be aware that if you Gazan the dragon, it will more often than not do more damage than just using a fire spell. So I think a lot of people sleep on this and how strong this is. Being able to potentially hit five times per cast with how fast Gazan is will almost always outdamage fire spells. Unless you're running some crazy all-fire build or something like that, Gazan will end up being your destroyer. 
Now, for those that don't know what Gafoe stacking is, essentially, if you are able to rapid cast Gafoe, aka the circular fireball spell, and an enemy spawns in, there's levels of stacks that I like to call it. There's enemies that will take all the damage of all the fireballs instantly, and I'll call that full Gafoe stacks. And there's some that take partial damage. So what do I mean by that? Sometimes there are waves that make you wait quite a long time. I forget if Mothfurts are there. Does chat remember offhand if Mothfurts are there? I will double check for that. I will put them under partial, if nothing else. I will correct this if this is not corrected later. I actually don't have a list in front of me. This was just all done from memory, so I'm sure there's a couple issues here. So there are enemies that will instantly take full damage. Those are the Rappies and Wolves. Any room that has those waves back to back mean that if you constantly spam Gafoe, the wave will spawn in, die. Next wave will spawn in, if it's them, they die. If the next wave spawns in and it's them, they die. And you can just wipe whole rooms like that and save a bunch of time. Now, the Moth this and the Moth Verts uh, potentially end up giving you partial stacks. What do I mean by that? So they take a little while to land and or spawn. So as soon as they fly out, they could fly into two to three prepped Gafoes. So it might be good. I'll also put nests there. It might be good to just stack those while you're waiting rather than wait for the wait for damage because they take very high fire damage and they tend to get stunned and it shuts them down pretty hard. So that's what I'll call partial Gafoe stacks where if you're fighting some combination of these things and you're able to get set up in a room, Gafoe is really powerful. So it really just depends on what kind of spawns you have. I find for Jarell's Ego, for example, where there's an extremely high enemy density, especially with Hildebears, I like Lightning more. But if you're fighting like most common areas, you're doing like government quests, they tend to be more Rappy and Wolf focused. So I'd probably lean a little more fire in those scenarios. Now we'll talk about something and additionally, there's something known as set damage in this game. I feel like people don't realize this, so I'm drawing attention to this. There are attacks that look like they are physical attacks, but they ignore your defense stat. So this is just a hard check to see whether or not you live. Your defense does not matter with the damage dealt to you. So you can plan around this for potentially triggering your mags. So if you're, if you're at 400 health and you take 300, or let's say you're, excuse me, let's say you're closer to like 700 health and you take 300, you could potentially reduce your health pretty low depending on where you are with your current health in order to trigger mag invincibility, for example, on purpose. Um, generally speaking, there's ways to avoid it. Like for Hildel, it's just don't don't cause them to jump, just constantly attack kind of things. And for the Sil Dragon, for example, uh, just don't be where it dives and you should be fine. So let's move on to caves. So for the notation here, make a note here. I'll do this once because I don't feel like doing this five million times in the in the guide. If you see a number in parentheses with a slash next to it, I'm referring to the minimum resistance required to ignore insta death in single player and multiplayer. So one of the really annoying gimmicks of caves is the fact that the lilies can now shoot insta-death shots. So my recommendation is bring in something that gives high EDK. So this could be uh, resist devils, like they could be very common units. This could be uh, secret gear, this could be attribute wall, uh, this could be certain armors. Um, but this is one of the few times you should really pay attention to EDK when you're starting out. There are ways you could basically ignore it, and again, it is what it is there. So I mentioned Cure Paralysis in the uh, Popper Guide, but being basically immune to the enemies there is kind of crucial for human characters. I'm going to skip the vocals on this song. So just make sure that if you're playing a human or a Newman that you have Cure Paralysis. Uh, otherwise, for cast their immune, it doesn't matter. And again, you should be entering all these later areas as a ranger with Frozen Shooter. Please bring Frozen Shooter. Please bring Frozen Shooter. <laughs> Please. 
I beg of you, don't do higher areas without it. It's just, it's a bad idea. Uh, one additional thing, though. You probably need to bring an AoE weapon if doing the boss. So this could be Partisans, these could be Calibers, these could be, to some extent, Slicers and things of that nature. No, those are generally recommended. Honestly, with Dragon, there's so many things that could kill it. I guess I could be more specific. Um, these can be multi-hit weapons. I'll give an example of Cannon Rouge. <laughs> Or multi shot. Multi. Multi shot weapon? I don't know. I don't know. I'll, I'll think about the phrasing with that. But charge Vulcans. Like, for example, a lot of characters will just use charge Vulcan on the dragon boss, and that's it. But I feel like for the caves boss, because there is enough of the things you have to fight, you should generally be bringing a big weapon in order to deal with it. So let, let's talk about slime duping. Uh, why is it important? Why it is important. It allows more chances of spawning the rare slimes and is also very fast XP. So from that perspective, there's a couple things you could do to force slimes to always split. I'm going to say slimes cannot Split into more than three additional slimes per, per original slime. Yeah, rares can be created from the split. See, this is why we got to put these notes in here. <laughs> I'm telling you, I didn't know for the longest time. I was like, I, I've heard it's one of those things where it's like, I've heard people say it, but I've never experienced it literally until this year. But it's really good. There are quite a few characters in Ultimate that can get useful items from slimes. So knowing that you could turn, for example, a room of four slimes into a room of 16 slimes, you get a lot more chances at the slime rares than you think. And with a cast in particular, you could kill them so fast that they end up actually being quite good sources of XP. Just casual ways you could use the fire trap so it's more useful. So for everybody that's not a cast, Rebarda. If you hit them with Rebarda, they split. It's that easy, it's guaranteed. However, if you're a cast, what you could do instead, if you attack three times, as long as you never attack again, all of your fire traps will cause the slimes to dupe. So if you are fighting, like for example, the room in TTF where the four slimes come in the corners and they converge in the middle, you go pow, 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 Fire trap, 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 and you delete the whole room. It's amazing. It's like, it is like one of the best examples of fire traps that I can think of that a lot of people probably don't know about unless they've seen people do it before. And in addition to that, let's say that you're lower level and and fire traps don't do a lot of damage because they're based off of your level. If you put a fire trap at the point where they spawn, like close to it, as long as your explosion hits the same point specifically, not has to be specifically exactly where they spawn, um, it will instantly kill a slime. It does not matter if this is ultimate, it does not matter if this is anguish, you will one-shot the slime. It is hilarious, it is dumb, it saves a lot of time. Please do this in your runs. I cannot understate at minimum, insta-killing slimes is expected for what you should be doing as a cast, slime duping it depends on the id and who you're partying with but just be aware these are like little things you could do as a cast that is like oh what a lifesaver i think i gave an example where um i think in ttf we were earning about 4,000 extra xp from one room of slime dupes and all it took was like four four to five fire traps like to dupe them and then one to kill the spawn point like, it's, it's really not hard to do. It's a lot of easy XP. Episode 1 is not the best at getting XP, but being able to squeeze it out of the runs as you're climbing is kind of important. I think people either, either A, don't know about it, or B, really underestimate 
how much you could get out of it. So let's talk about more uh, ultimate gimmicks. Crimson Assassins, the Grasshopper things, or yeah. Those things now just freeze you instead of rooting you in place. So you can actually equip a Cure Freeze and be completely immune to them. And they are a total joke. That enemy is not serious. That enemy is more often than not not doing anything to you. Like GG. <laughs> like, like actual GG. It's over. That enemy is so nerfed in ultimate. It's hilarious. Mob Lilies are really, really scary. If you don't have death resistance in multiplayer, you are basically coin flipping every single time they're allowed to cast a Megid and you die. And this often leads to a lot of new players dying. So I'm, I'm putting as an additional note, respect the Cave Lily insta-kill and paralysis until you can clear them easily. Do note though, if you stand really close to them, for example when they spawn, they will try to melee you instead of Megid, as long as they're not already in the Megid casting animation. So you can take advantage of that um, as they are coming in. I'll double check that sentence in a moment. Uh, so that way you can lock down more lilies at once. So that's just like a little minor strategy. Some of that's position base. I think I meant to say before it splits. So one enemy that is kind of a problem for multiple characters, at least until you force it to split, Pan Arms. Pan Arms defense is insanely high, like even more so than usual. If you do not have Zalor or Demon, you're doing zero damage, straight up. You're a fresh character in Ultimate, there is no way you're doing meaningful damage to this thing, especially in multiplayer. This is one of the highest defense enemies in the game. So this is where, if you have one of those, I would specifically get something out for them to speed it up. You could use text to damage them a little bit, of course. Uh, I'm going to say be aware. i make a note here for players that aren't aware of this. Be aware that freeze slash confuse slash paralysis prevents them from splitting. I've seen people not realize that confuse stops them from splitting. So sometimes you could do that if you want the rare item to be the Pan Arms, because there are like one or two IDs that do care about that. Uh, so just be aware that if you're looking for more of a window to kill them, probably try some status ailments to deal with them. The other big thing is De Relay attacks way faster with its cynicals, and its pattern is completely changed. So we, we have a separate section on them down below. We have, we're going to call it additional boss tips. Most of the time, the bosses aren't... If, if there's not enough to really talk about, I don't bother putting additional boss tips. Like, Dragon Boss is so close to the regular one that it, it's almost not even worth talking about, other than to mention it's very slightly different. Like, fire versus ice kind of things. But I think the Worm Boss is pretty important. So, the boss will always start on the left side and ultimate on the raft. If you hold forward and you go to the edge of the raft, you will always dodge the shots. So this is a really big, easy way to just get a lot of damage. And knowing that safe spot and or realizing that uh, mag invincibility is super crucial in this boss fight, both of those go a long way to being able to deal with the rest of the boss. And honestly, once you get to like probably mid game, maybe early end game, this worm boss might not even leave the beaching phase. Like, it might beach twice and then only once after a certain point of time. So just be aware that uh, it is consistent, it's not random, the pattern's different compared to very hard. So let's talk about uh, what your focuses should be as a hunter, especially if you're partying with forces. Lilies, Nano Dragons, Grass Assassins. So there's not really like a lot of annoying enemies in caves, but priority number one is Lilies. If you leave Lilies alone, they will party wipe you, period. You're dead. Never leave lilies alone. Everybody should be on lily duty, honestly, unless there's only like two lilies for four players or something like that. Um, the other one that's kind of annoying for forces to deal with in multiplayer specifically are nano dragons. They fly around, they have a lot of set damage. Um, they require a lot of ice spam to kill, which often they'll go out of range of because they like to fly. And they're just kind of annoying to deal with. The other thing where, again, it's preferred for forces to not have to deal with it, Grass Assassins. 
Well, Grass Assassins can be killed somewhat quickly by forces. If the force doesn't have Cure Freeze and has lower level techs, they will interrupt the force pretty often. So that's why I decided to put them on the list over some of the other enemies. Uh, but I would really recommend highly for Nano Dragons that you you basically mech gun them out of existence and then probably have a combination of slicers slash shot uh, for multiple Lily Lockdown. Let me split this actually. I'm just gonna write the word shotgun. <laughs> How's that, chat? <laughs> Versus almost everything. Keep this going forward. Versus almost... Versus enemies in high numbers. There's a better way of phrasing that. So basically, the what I'll, what I'll shorthand is the tech MVPs. Rezond is so good in caves. It's so good. I cannot tell you how good it is other than you have to experience it. It is like... The forces clear very fast in like surface and other areas of episode 4 compared to a lot of the earlier characters uh, when starting ultimate, but man Rezond dunks on caves. Holy... You, there's like... There's certain quests where there's like 12 lilies at once and then you could kill them in like four casts with Razan with just like a one one or two tech boosts. Like that's really hard for rangers and hunters to compete with. In fact, there are several quests specific to caves that I just feel the forces straight up do better in solo. Like I know it's a weird statement to say, but like I really genuinely think there are certain fast reset quests where if it's a really high lowly quest, they just clear so fast. <laughs> It's like a ranger can only hit like five targets, a hunter can only hit like five targets. The force is clearing 14 enemies at once, potentially. It's very silly. Do not sleep on the force in caves. They are actually pretty good at it. Although I do think the males have a bonus towards it just because of the fact that A, they could get items more easily with death resist or dark resist. Uh, but also B, the fast casts lead to absolute lockdowns early on and you don't need any special items. So there are a lot of enemies that do take full damage of Gafoe, so if they're out of range and then they come into range or they spawn in, they take massive damage. Those are your Grass Assassins, your Lilies, your Slimes, your Daylo Rays. So if you don't have Fire Traps to instantly kill the Slime Monsters, uh, stacking it means they could just die instantly, they just explode. Lily spawning in can instantly die to, to Gafoe as well. Uh, Grass Assassins die almost instantly in there. They could completely shut down by Gafoe. There's actually nothing they could do. Every time they go to freeze you, they just get hit by another Gafoe. It's so sad. And then if De La Rey ever goes out of range and hops over you, they'll take full Gafoe damage from it. It's very silly. So just be aware. Technically, this might be partial stack, because it's hard to... I don't think it's possible to test the, it on spawn, but the way it's used, you could use Gafoe to hit them while they're in the air. So just be aware that uh, laser damage is kind of high in multiplayer. 581 will kill a lot of early forces. So forces were kind of like the god clear of worm boss in lower difficulties. I don't feel like that's mostly true anymore. I, I feel like this boss in particular is where you start to see hunters and rangers really, really hard outshine the force, sadly to say. So let's move on to one of my least favorite areas in episode one with the ultimate changes. You'll see there is a there is a lot of gimmicks. <laughs> That's why I don't like it. So if you're under 900 health, the mines are actually not too bad. If you have mediocre defense, like not even like endgame stuff, just like rare armors and rare shields, even from very hard mode, you'll, you'll probably be fine. If you start going over 900 health, Kiss your life total goodbye. You are going to be absolutely deleted in this game because you're going to hit a magical number where enemy attacks no longer knock you down and you will die instantly due to multiplayer having lower iframes. It is actually insane how fast you take damage. In particular, if you're fighting Sinnohs early on, uh, you're probably going to get one-shot killed. 
by these things. They are really high damage, and they have some really annoying gimmicks. Riffy says, Big biggest reason is an ult where boss immediately jumps on Wrath and normal variety and screws around for two minutes. Exactly. Yeah, I feel like even Hunters, uh, being able to position early for the Jaya swings or your charge partisans, it's just so much easier. So even Hunter kind of outclears. Yeah, Mines is miserable. Like, Mines has a lot of really good rares, but be aware that this is one of the harder areas for most characters to clear, and it purely has to do off your health total. So sometimes, I'm not even kidding, I will make ult characters specifically to run mines before my health gets too high, so that way I can clear, get knocked down, and the clear is safe. Whereas if I have like a thousand health or like 950 health, I just kind of die to everything instantly. Or if I have like 1300 health, but like not great defense versus Sinnohs, I just get hit twice in multiplayer, lose half my health, get hit twice again, die. Like they are just ludicrous chat. They are so horrible to experience. So I'm really going to recommend in multiplayer for this in particular. Freeze traps are basically mandatory. Frozen shooters are basically mandatory. Debuffs are only really needed if you don't have one of these options to deal with Sinnohs. Or if you're dealing with a quest with a lot of Sinnohs, because there's some quests that only like trickle feed them. So you might fight like one or two at a time, which are tolerable. But there's other quests where you fight between four to six at a time and you're done. You're, if you're not playing debuffs and freeze, it's over. Like, just don't even bother. Like, honestly, don't even bother with the run. You're going to die so many times with that health total. It's insane. If you get if you get knocked down, it's not too bad. But be aware that you're probably going to have to be spamming trimates rather than just dimates or monomates when you stand up. Because you need to be able to damage them when you're standing again. So, here's some of the... So, fast clears. Basically... Basically, Berserk ATP. I'll say Gafoe stacking in some some quests. Uh, I'll give an honorable mention to Gafoe stacking. Uh, so here's the problem. Almost every enemy takes fire damage now. And that means you can no longer shock them for free. So in the lower difficulties, you used to be able to use lightning. So not only did they you instantly hit them full screen with Razond or Gazan them and hit a chain of enemies, you possibly just stun lock them and you did high damage and you crowd controlled them. Can no longer do that. So that's that's number one. So Forces got a hard nerf there. Hard nerf number two. Multiplayer Barans, hilarious damage. Hilarious chat. Let's let's see how much he does, allegedly. So he does 480, or they or whatever. The machine does 480. And potentially one missile attack will do anywhere between, uh, let's say 1360 and 1800, depending on if you've made them berserk or not. And because this doesn't knock you down, if your health total is too high, you just die. <laughs> like, I, I can't emphasize how unfair this is. I, I really, really dislike this enemy. It's not as bad in single player because... The same attack will hit half as often, so it'll only be doing like 900, which is still a lot. Like, it'll still break 900, but it's not doing like 1,800 or more per Barans. I would like to clarify, that's per Barans, by the way. That enemy is like actually stupid how unfair that is in multiplayer. That is like the wake-up call for new players. This area is terrible. Another reason why this is really bad for beginning players without going through what I considered the early game Sinnohs no longer have hit stun. I cannot stress to you how irritating this is. If you don't have freeze, it's just like, what do you do? You're, you're playing Ramar? What are you doing as Ramar without Frozen Shooter? Nothing, chat. You're getting murdered. <laughs> that's what. Only good part about brands is they friendly fire each other. Yeah, that's technically true. If they let you. <laughs> so, yeah, just be aware that they cannot be stunned at all. None of your combos are safe. It is always a slugfest with them unless you have freeze. Sinnoh Blues, more specifically, can go invisible. I as well spell out the word here. And they basically disappear from the radar. So they kind of have what I consider like the predator camouflage. They warp the area around them so you can see where they are. Uh, but yeah. They could be quite, quite annoying, for sure. 
One additional thing, the Sinnoh Reds, they go from just using Resta to using Shift to D-Band and Resta. So if you thought Sinnoh Blue was doing big damage before, wait till you wait till you fail to kill Sinnoh Red in time, and that Shift to D-Band will destroy you. It will destroy you. I have seen this thing hit I have seen this thing hit me before, chat. No joke, multiplayer. One punch with Shifta did 980 damage to one of my forces. This thing is gonna delete you. This is why I don't recommend multiplayer forces, unless you have really, really good team. I consider this an endgame for MST. The raw damage everything can do to you, in addition with the fact that the even the basic enemies can just be immune to being knocked backwards, means that you just have to be able to pump the damage. And the only way to really do that is levels and endgame items. So, kind of a miserable experience in multiplayer. It's not as bad in single player, because there are so many things that you can gofoey. But I want to stress to you that this place is miserable. I, I don't even like to do this most of the time anymore. Honestly, this might be one of my least favorite areas in the game. I'm not sure if it's up to my episode 2 levels of d disgust, but it, it's pretty bad. Uh, I also just want to point out that uh, Bolt Off Phase 1, uh, he does elemental attacks now, Freeze being the most deadly. If you are in like the middle of the arena and it shoots the, the, the good Barda equivalency, it's very likely to do like 1800 plus damage and kill you. Even with good ice resist, you're probably still taking like 1000 plus damage. So maybe with Mag Invincibility, you might get saved if you get hit by it multiple times, but this is probably something just to be aware of. Um, unfortunately, Ball Up Phase 2 also now has a random attack pattern, which is funny because, like, the Worm Boss is, like, a set pattern, but Vault Up isn't. And also be aware that in order to dodge the cage... I'll, I'll, I'll call it the cage orb. I don't really know what they're called. Um, you do need to run in circles. You can't just outrun them now. So let's talk about, uh, specific tips that aren't specifically gimmicks for ultimate monitors. This is one that I know a lot of people have requested to be put in the guide, and I don't blame them. Because knowing about this is, like, night and day difference on how you're able to clear, uh, Vault Up in ultimate. So... Vault Off Phase 1 has a unique mechanic, not really seen anywhere else. Essentially, there is a central head that goes around behind the monitors, and if it's in f if there's a monitor set between you and the head, you could target the monitors and damage it. Most people know that. Most people don't know is that when it calculates the damage the boss should be taking to go to the next phase, it only cares about your attack power or the ATP. So, I really recommend even if you're playing MST to clear to this point, please put on all of your power boosting abilities that you can while either maintaining attack speed if you're going uh, Hunter or Ranger, or that allow you to equip really high ATP weapons as a force. And then as soon as you're done with it, swap it out. And knowing how to swap mags, potentially in the middle of a boss battle, is another great example of why you should learn to use the function menus mid-battle. Because the equipment menu will allow you to do that very easily between phase 1 and phase 2 to set up how you want to be set up. So, on top of only being able to damage them with ATP, be aware that the boss can only take damage every, let's say, about second and a half. There's, there's a noticeable pause where it cannot take damage. So if everybody's focusing the monitors and you destroy the monitors, that is really bad. Because you just lost a set of monitors to stunlock the boss, You've lost the ability to basically control the boss, and you're making it a lot harder for other players to stun lock. So this is probably one of the few examples where I will go into items before we go through the items, because these items are so core to the strategies, I need to talk about them, and we'll cover them in another part. So just be aware, there are massive, massive beat sticks. I'm talking like 800 plus ATP on equip. There are your Excalibers, your Galatines, even to some extent, things like a Partisan, like a Yunchang. Anything with like really massive ATP is preferred with a, a unit. If you're uh, called Vieta 1, which speeds up the cast time of Tex for Humar and Ramar, in order to Gazan. If you don't have this for whatever reason, 
Generally speaking, the strategy is to get an item called the Red Handgun, because it's a very high ATP uh, pistol, and stun lock it. Or, if you've been going roughly in difficulty order, you should have been through a place in Ruins, so for example, Ruins 1, for example, uh, to pick up Spread Needle, plus Heavenly Battle. There's also an item called Twin Blaze, which is very situational. Just be aware that it's good in multiplayer, not that great in single player. Just ask, just ask if it's worth using it. Most people will tell you if it is. But basically, it's just ways of damaging the screens and either super multiplying your damage because your your tiny little Gazan doing 30 damage to the monitors is technically doing as much damage as your held weapon, or the Twin Blaze Fireball with the Gafoe special does that damage, or you have something that just very easily stunlocks the monitor, so just normal, 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 normal. Never heavy attack, never special monitors. And you should, for every three hits, hit the boss twice. Unless you're like really mashing it. So just be aware, that that's the, those are the things to look for. So refer back to this when we go into items in more details. But just be aware that the strategy is to wield these weapons. So it doesn't matter if you're a force. You are expected at some point to get these things. I think we covered basically everything there. So if you're not on monitor duty, which is what I'm going to call it, you should be on turret duty. So basically, for whatever reason, the stun lock is dropped or, you know, you don't have like the high level gear to beat it in that one cycle before it attacks. Your goal is to look for the red turret, defeat the red turret, damage it with whatever you can, burst it, don't mess around with it. If you kill it, it stops you from being damaged, and basically everybody's happy. The people will generally pull out things like double sabers, or charge vulcans, or anything that potentially produces a lot of damage to a single target, and whatever you're most comfortable with, you use it essentially. So all that was just boss tips, thanks mines. <laughs> anyway. Hunter and Ranger party tips. So, what what does the force need help with? Barans, the force is not killing this. I'm sorry. This enemy is absolutely miserable in multiplayer to kill. You might as well as just put up a big sign that says, hit me, I'm gonna die. <laughs> Whenever you're bringing a force here, because there is, you do basically zero damage to Barans, unfortunately. Um, Sinnohs are also really scary. I'd rate them a little below Barans but they are probably your priority number one. And then I would say the additional thing to look out for are the uh, cannabin leaders. So for example, if you fight a ring formation of flying robots, the different colored one in the center usually does not take damage from the force unless they switch what text they're using. So your job is to kind of burst that with mech guns. So they're not like really threatening, but it does lead to a lot of missed items if you don't do this. So those are the things I would say you should probably focus on if you aren't sure. Emphasizing, please freeze all high priority targets. Please do not let any of the Sinnohs or Barans do anything. It, they will probably party wipe you through raw damage. Um, we talk a little bit about, oops. We talk a little bit about um, strategies you could deal with the Barans. So there are two basic things you could do, essentially, if you put your back to the wall. I'm not sure how many people know that you could do this. If, you're, if your back is to the wall and the, and the Barans is directly in front of you and it launches the missiles, the missiles can't actually hit you, but it has to be close. They can't be, like, full screen. They have to be within, I don't know, let, let's say, like, six steps of a wall. If they're within six steps of the wall, which a lot of rooms they actually happen to be, because you have to think about it in, like, the S-shaped rooms where they like to spawn, the wall is really close to them, and they usually move forward a little bit. Um, you can make yourself completely immune to their missiles, and you can kind of cheese them that way. Um, otherwise, I would recommend running in tight circles, and you could do that around other Barans to get them hit by the missiles. Put a little note here. And run around enemies to have them take damage as well. Otherwise, run really deep into doorways. So just be aware that even if you go through a doorway slash hallway, um, you are not safe. Missiles can occasionally just go into the hallway. So make sure you run really deep and make sure those missiles exploded. 
I cannot tell you how many times I've seen players die because they take like four steps in the hallway, think it's safe, physically turn around and just instantly die because the brand's missile's right there. So just be aware that that's a thing that can happen. Um, there are, uh, what's called dub witches. I thought they were called dub switches with like a TCH sound, but they're more like sandwiches, I guess the best way to put it. But the flying switch that accompanies some of the Rock'em Sock'em robots, those can be hit early with weapons with big AoE, so like any, any bazooka type weapon will do it. I, I believe in, even Guilty Light in most scenarios could do the same thing. Um, or weapons with unlimited height, like Frozen Shooter. And there's also, again, I'm going to mention again, one of my favorite weapons for support as a hunter, Kunai's. There's some weapons that just seem to go through walls for some reason. I don't really see it mentioned anywhere in the weapon descriptions or in general, even on the wiki. But those Kunai's will go right through solid objects to hit those switches. It doesn't make sense, because your pistol shots and your rifle shots will get stopped, but... Bro, throw, throw like a card or a kunai, it goes through. So those are crucial for not spending a million a million minutes fighting each of the reviving dub switches and looking for the right one. Um, another big thing, fire traps work on nearly everything. Please fire trap. This is like fire trap heaven. It's like what doesn't fire trap work on? Barans. That that's it. <laughs> <laughs> like, like uh, honest statement, J just Barans. Even the Sinnohs that are slightly resistant to fire still take decent damage from it. And again, if you're running away from their punches, it's just free damage. Uh. Oh, also, make sure not to confuse Barans. I've seen players do this. There's only one scenario where it should be used, and that's if you're by yourself, no one else is in the room, and you need to clear the room, potentially for the party, or in a split route. So if you confuse Trap of Brands, they will target each other, they will die very fast. This is great for room clear, but do not do this with your teammates there, because the missiles will still hit your teammates, and your teammates will die, and they'll be like, why didn't you freeze trap? Don't be that person that confuse traps the brands. <laughs> That's what's known as a bad idea if you're not able to control them. Um, there's also one thing that's kind of annoying with the Rock'em Sock'em robots, the Guild Chicks and the Dub Chicks. So Confuse Traps were to some extent. So the enemies check every once in a while whether or not they should be lasering a player. And if they decide to laser, they will not laser each other, they will only laser you, even if they are actively punching other targets. It's kind of annoying. They're one of the few enemies in the game I've seen have, like, what we'll call quote-unquote partial confuse resist and it makes this area miserable as i said before so they already have all these gimmicks and then traps don't quite work on them as intended and one other very annoying thing with them is if you go too far away in the same room they also will stop fighting each other so unlike almost every other enemy in the game where they fight if you're not in the same room these guys have a real short attention span so it kind of sucks. That, that, that's the bit moral of the story. Mine's kind of suck, chat. <laughs> Just, they're, they're not fun. I put them higher on the clear ratings for that reason. So what text should you be using as force? Gafoi, Rafoi. Like, there are some very rare times you will rebarda. Otherwise, it's Gafoi Rufoi. If you're playing multiplayer, those are possibly the only texts you will be using the entire time. Um, but yeah, just be aware of how much damage Sinnohs do. It's a judgment call and just experience whether or not you should debuff them. Again, if you're in single player, there's not really a downside to it. In multiplayer, it can be bad if people are kind of in the in-between range. So let's say you're like 140, Zulora might be bad. If you're like 190, Zulora's probably okay. But again, it, it, it's all down to what kind of gear they're wearing and how high their defense is. Some players play with really high defense, and then they're basically immune, and, so, and using Jelen makes it so that you don't take basically any damage. In fact, like high level uh, Jelen on multiplayer Sinnohs can lead to some characters being completely immune. So again, check with the other players. They'll be able to help you with that. 
And again, that is purely based off of what defense you have. Because, I mean, you could go from as anything wide range as, like, a offensive barrier with no defense to something like Gracia, which gives, like, 280 defense and, like, all this other nonsense. It's, like, a pretty big difference in stats. So, when in doubt, you should probably be gefoing. The Sinnohs can take damage when they're spawning and landing. Cannabins, the flying robots, take a lot of damage. Gilchicks have some immunity, but if you have Gafoeys kind of waiting to hit them, they could get molly walked essentially by a wall of them. So even in some scenarios, you'll probably still Gafoe spam if it's just Gilchick waves into Sinnohs, for example. Uh, be aware that the Jubchicks and the Gilchicks are fairly aggressive with lasers if you're not constantly hitting them. So they can end up doing quite a lot of set damage to players. This is kind of like the first hurdle to survival, because most people will not have like 800 health the first time that they're in ultimate in mines, unless you're like you cast or something. This be where it could be super, super bad. The other thing I want to point out with the set damage, I don't care so much about the boss numbers, you can read that on your own. The one I find really funny is the, the prison. <laughs> The prison attack, if you get hit by the caging orb, does 1,480 damage in multiplayer. I don't know why. <laughs> like, in single player, 640. In multiplayer, 1480. I'm like, what? <laughs> so yeah, please unprison people. Or kill the boss instantly. Choose one. Oh yeah, so we, we've gone through mines. Let's go a little further. Let's talk about Ruins. So, this is where you basically enter the no-fun zone for forces. This is one of a few areas where, essentially, you are expected in multiplayer to bring ATP and demons and or some status effects for uh, Dark Gunners. Let me just write this here. So there fortunately aren't too many gimmicks in Ruins. So I would say the biggest change would be the Indie Belras, the giant kind of uh, statue-esque monsters that shoot their hands every now and then, but move very slow. Well, in Ultimate, they don't move at all. But they constantly... With Flying Fist. I'll say with Flying Fist. They constantly shoot their fist at you. Which is very, very annoying, because the damage is very, very high. Uh, this is one of the few times where it looks like it's set damage, but it's actually physical damage. Reminder... This can be Jelland. Yeah, the Rocket Punch is quite something else. Uh, Darkbringers now unequip you if they hit you during the charge. Multiplayer Darkbringer is basically immune to force attacks. Tee <laughs> Um, the other big thing is that the Grand Sorcerers go from... I think they use... Oh, chat, it's been so long since I played very hard mode. I want to say it's Rafoe Rabarda, Resta. They change over to Grant's Megid. And the Grant's... Or not the Grant's. The Megid level is kind of crazy. So they have a 90% chance of killing you if you have zero EDK. And they are kind of bad to leave alone. Kill them quickly. Yeah, put another remember to say Rabarda. I'm gonna I'm gonna add the same thing here. So just a reminder that Del Sabers go into like a animation where they flinch. They basically put like their hand up like they're recoiling from a blow. And it's a pretty long animation. So you could repeatedly Rebarda lock them. They're there. Oh, it's Gibbarda in very hard mode. Thank you. It, it's been a while. Generally, we have killed sorcerers recently, but they die so fast. I don't get to see the ice technique. They die usually on or about Rafoe. Uh, but yeah, just be aware of that. The Grants is not a huge deal, to be honest with you. It is undodgeable damage, which is annoying for casts. 
Yeah, it's 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 not too too bad comparatively. Megid is the thing that'll kill parties potentially. Um, so boss tips for falls: please bring a high ATP pistol or rifle. Orgafoe is a force to one shot the pistol or to one shot the spinners. So one additional thing is. The spinners themselves can be killed with most things kind of easily. Their weakness is technically ice in single player, but most people will end up stacking Gafoe so that they can just kill them instantly. So it's just one of those things. Whether whether it actually truly stacks or not usually doesn't matter, because if you've cast three Gafoe's and then another wave comes in, they usually get hit by at least two and die. The so Gafoe is the preference there. I'm actually going to make a note here. Consider holding a weapon, even if mail force, to shrink your hurt box when casting Gafoe. So here's my little little tip here. So while barehanded casting is pretty fast, and it can deal with the spinners really quickly, especially if you Rafoe, for example, um, I would consider if you're casting Gafoe, because you're locked in place for so long, you're very likely to get hit by a spinner, unless you have like really, really pristine positioning and a little bit of luck with how uh, some of the movement of the spinners are going. So just be aware that uh, certain weapons will keep your stance really tight. I actually always like to use Bringer's Rifle, which I thought was funny. Not to shoot them, but just to make sure the male's casting stance was close together to avoid getting multi-hit by uh, the spinners. Sadly, the spinners can multi-hit you very quickly in multiplayer, and that really negates most of the issue there. This is probably one of the few times, I will say, to equip something, even if male force, uh, to avoid that particular issue. So phase one is mostly, at low levels, somebody has to take care of spinners that come out of the central head. Otherwise, your goal, otherwise, Goal is to hit the other heads with high single target damage. And I'm gonna say end near the ending near the top of the arena allows pot shots on phase two. So basically this doesn't really change too much in between, but I figure for people that are kind of struggling with this, it's usually because they let the spinners run wild. So, you can get away with Gabarda-ing to hurt the boss, or Gafoe-ing to also hurt the boss while taking care of spinner duty, so more often than not, forces will be doing that while rangers and hunters focus on the head. Just be aware of that. Um, next is a phase two. Specifically for the I fire and ice spells, I don't think people realize that some of these are dodgeable. So if you're playing in single player, and let's say you're on the right side of the arena, and the boss goes up in the air, and then down. Or, or, excuse me, it goes straight down, and it goes below the arena. In the time it goes below the arena, walk away from wherever you're standing. So if you're on the right side, go left. If you're on the left, go right. And if you do that, more often than not, you'll fully dodge the spells. If in the upper half. So let's say try to hug the arena edges if standing in the half of the arena closest to falls. So what I mean by that is that there are different movements you should be doing. So let's say you are I guess on the opposite end of the boss. It's better usually just to go in a straight... I would say diagonal? I feel like if you end up in the middle of the arena, you normally die. You know, I might even say this. Let, let me rephrase this. Try to hug the arena edges to reduce the multi-hit by spells. So, like, let's say you're on, like, the far right edge already. You can just walk into the middle and dodge. And then from the middle, you could go left or right and dodge. But if you end up going from, like, the bottom of the arena to the middle of the arena, the reason why that's bad is if you're focused, 
One, you're not going side to side, so that's a big issue. So you're going to get hit. Two, the spell ricochets on the way back. So it can make a pretty sharp turn. But if you've just been walking in a straight line, it basically multi-hits you. And funny enough, going like dead center in the arena is where you're going to get hit the most in that scenario. Because it's going to hit you coming, then going. And then as you try walking further away, you introduce yourself getting hit more and more. Because the spell could potentially hit you a little more in between each shot. So it's it's super bad to end in the arena, or the middle of the arena. Uh, the other attack that it uses, Divine Punishment, can sometimes be dodged uh, by moving in like a cardinal direction relative to your starting position. So let's say you're like slightly to the right of Falls and it's using Divine Punishment. If you go to the left of Falls, you will generally dodge it. If you're in the middle of the arena and you hold forward, you will generally dodge it. If you're in the middle of the arena and you go backwards, you will generally dodge it. As long as you don't like hesitate and just pick like a core direction you will dodge it more than you think you would so i just wanted to put that there for people that are looking to survive that set damage um the other thing i'm going to warn about is that the double laser attack even if you don't know the exact movement pattern which even i have to get better at that of dodging the double lasers uh completely even if you don't know how to do that if you keep moving at all it reduces the chances of you getting double hit. Now I'm gonna say reduces the chances because I have been hit and you could go back in the stream recordings. I have been hit while moving. I, I could be at different animations, different speeds. I will get double hit by this stupid boss. This is one of my least favorite attacks in the game. Sometimes it feels like RNG depending on the character. I feel like wide characters in particular tend to get bodied by it. Like wide and tall get absolutely destroyed by this boss. It's kind of annoying. I don't know wide in the sense like the character has to be wide or the character itself is always naturally wide. Like the difference of like a rock has width versus like a force, for example, regardless of like the other skills. But there, there are just some enemies where like if you're just even slightly not positioned correctly while running, if you're perfectly in the middle of the ricochet, it will still double hit you. And it's very stupid. I hate this attack chat. Please nerf this attack. As you'll see, actually, we'll, we'll do a little shortcut. As a spoiler, in multiplayer, that could do 1400 damage, so you're just dead if that happens. Or in single player, it does uh, 1220, which is still insane and will probably still kill most players. This is also why I think you should hold off on doing falls into much later. There's just so many points where if you take too long, the set damage is just so high across the board. That as a cast, you're just going to run out of items, and as a force, you're just going to get one shot repeatedly without scape dolls. It's kind of a kind of a subpar experience until you get later in the game. So this is why I consider this end game area for the most part. Whereas I don't feel like Vault Up really needs anything special to clear. The area leading to Vault Up is terrible in Mines, where Ruins is not that bad. It it, it gets a bad rap. It is hard at points with bad gear. But there's a lot of options around them too, in particular with using things like Rebarda. So, I think that covers basic boss phases. I'm sure there's more tips. If chat has more, we could probably add to the document post-stream, of course. So always make sure to check out the document in the description below, if it were. But anyway, up next we have the What Are Your Priority Targets as a Hunter Ranger? Oh. Uh... Let me rename this. Chaos Springers. Or excuse me, they're not Chaos Springers. I think they're Dark Ringers. Technically in uh, Ultimate. And Sorcerers. So the Dark Ringers are horrible. We, we talked earlier. They have hyper, hyper, hyper boosted resistances. Forces cannot kill these. They need to use ATP. Early level forces will not have ATP options. They won't be wielding the proper ATP mag. They won't be materialed up in order to have like 100 power from their materials in order to deal with it. It's just a miserable experience for them. Don't make them fight Darkbringers. It's so bad. And then finally, the Grand Sorcerers. These are really... Like, forces could technically deal with them in single player, but in multiplayer... They only take a little bit of damage from fire, and 
It, it just, it, they just have so much raw health. They just help them. It's such a bad time for them. I would technically put Indy Belris here, but honestly, forces don't really struggle with them. Yes. I'll tentatively put that there. Uh, the other thing to probably look out for are uh, Dark Gunners and Death Gunners. So normally they're just invincible to you as they bounce around. So if you if you hit them with a Freeze Trap or Paralyze them or Frozen Shooter them, etc. Uh, you can make them targetable and it makes it so much easier to clear. Please do not do Ruins without these options. It will feel super bad to do. And as a reminder, please do not confuse the anti Belra. Don't do it. If you do it, they're going to spin around in circles, firing randomly. And, uh, yeah, you're probably going to get the party hit. It's kind of bad. Uh, so let's talk about techniques that are useful from the force clear perspective. Because I think solo force does use a decent amount of uh, ATP and tech as they climb. So the basic claw enemies and Itty Belras are devastated by the Zon techniques, as are one-third of the elemental grunts, as I like to call them. So having Razan Gazan can allow for some very fast clears in certain quests because there is a super high density of claws or there's a super high density of Indy Belras in a lot of the more popular quests. Now the other thing to denote is uh, Barda and Rabarda. Del Sabers take pretty good damage from Rabarda and Barda, but also it puts them in the animation. Bull claws, being able to freeze them is huge and being able to use Barda to hit through enemies to hit them is huge. And actually, let me check if it's Chaos Bringer or Dark Bringer. I already forgot chat. One second. I just want to make it uniform in the guide. In solo, uh, the Dark Bringer equivalency is able to take a lot of damage from Ice Techs in solo play, but they are just absolutely, as I said before, miserable to fight otherwise. Yeah, they. Sh I think it. Yeah, and very hard they're Chaos Bringers, so they should be Dark Bringer. And myself second guessing myself there. The uh, in general, if you're going to be fighting a lot of the dark bringers or sorcerers, there's not a lot you can really do with MST. As I said before, it's just really horribly inefficient to try to kill them with spells. So it's recommended you bring demons and or ATP weapons. So I think otherwise, uh, I do know that for, uh, weirdly enough, like, if forces have the raw HP to survive, I think forces actually do just fine against falls for the most part, with the caveat that you need to get a lot of help from something, whether it's, like, heavenly HPs or HP materials or whatever. But the simple techs actually really rock the boss start to finish. So, for example, you can rebarta the spinners to hurt the boss for decent damage and control the spinners. Zond is okay versus Phase 1 as well. Um, phase 3 Foey goes through the Protective Rainbow Shield, which is kind of nice. Not too much craziness here. The big thing to look out for is... Oh, I actually see damage missing here. One moment. Let's double check the damage. So there is really high damage from the Darkbringer monster in particular. And that enemy is a huge, huge problem for uh, forces in particular in multiplayer. Let's confirm, because I believe it's been written out. Let's put another category here, so Darkbringer. essentially what we have to look out for are the charge shots. So occasionally if you hit it, it'll go from kind of like a blue to a red color. When it goes red, it'll charge up and it'll attempt to siphon TP. If it siphons basically any amount of TP, it's going to boost the damage. So in normal mode, It does 480 to 900 damage, which is insane. That'll kill most Force players. Excuse me, 980 damage. That'll kill most Force players on the spot. In multiplayer, it's 700 to 1400. So again, you need basically endgame level HP for Forces. Like, no joke. Like, level 180 plus, HP materials, potentially. 
you are not surviving this without a lot of boosts, because it is going to steal your TP and you're gonna die. Which is hilarious if you fight it as a cast and it does like 700, where you're like, oh, I don't really care about that. I have like 1300 health because I'm a raw cast or whatever. But yeah, they just don't care about it. I'll say higher damage if enemy absorbs. Okay. Just to clarify why there's a, well why it's quote unquote set damage, but it's a range. So otherwise, Falls has a lot of damaging moves. The swipes doing 800 damage is probably the the minimum HP I would recommend in multiplayer in order to deal with Falls. Otherwise, you just kind of die to everything. Like, when you're being carried, it's not too bad, but if you're looking for, like, a genuine clear, it's kind of brutal there. So anyway, chat, we did all that. We've now reached episode two. As you can see, we're going to take a break once we're uh, done with talking about the basic episodes. But here's, here's my honest opinion. Episode two, Play Ranger. Play Ranger in nearly every area. There's no reason not to. Everything here is basically super, super, super weak to either Insta-Death or Frozen Shooter. So if you have that and or Freeze Traps, you will shut down basically all of the problem spawns in this game. If you do not have those, like you're a force that was like, oh, I could go beyond Temple because Temple was easy. Little, little do you know how brutal Episode 2 can be. <laughs> but anyway, uh... Sadly, if you're planning on playing MST for forces, outside of Temple and maybe Solo Spaceship, I don't think any area will be taking tech damage from you at all. Your MST only matters in the sense that, uh, how much, how much of it do you need to learn better Megid? And even then, Megid is not preferred for true endgame. There's an item called uh, V501 and V502 which boosts the hell chance on common weapons. That is the meta. But before you get that, Megid is pretty good. So it depends. If you're playing like classic mode, for example, uh, Megid will generally outperform hell without any boosts, unless the enemy is frozen. So just be aware of that. It just depends on you're playing classic mode or not. Um. Yeah, so the other thing is that because there's so few techs that are needed for damage, generally speaking, you could get away with a Hume, hu uh, not a, yeah, Hunor, Hunoral or a Ramoral. Uh, because of the fact that the A, they provide higher ATP, which is how you clear basically everything that you fight. B, they provide like just enough in terms of buffs and debuffs to deal with some of the worst enemies in the area. And then three, they just have better accuracy. So if all you're doing is using hell-based weapons, which is what most people are anyway, why not just go in with a character with like 20% more accuracy? The run is literally easier. <laughs> so it's just kind of one of those things. Force feels super bad to play here most of the time. I feel bad for people that are here outside of maybe temple clears, just because of how lopsided it is and the clear speed of like a ranger with hell versus Hunter with Hell versus Poor Force MST only. Yeah, be aware too that if you don't have any Hell weapons and you're, you're just kind of starting out, Paralysis is actually surprisingly effective in most areas against the Grunt enemies, but usually by the time you get even just a basic V5 unit, um, it's you should just be Helling. And, and most of the times you should be Helling anyway, to be honest. But be aware that this is technically an alternative. So for example, if you're a human ranger and you already have somebody on frozen shooter duty, you can paralyze the frozen target to really just forever lock them down. So that way you can land your slightly bad version of hell in case you don't have those V units. But anyway, my recommendation, because the awful murder lilies are here, make sure to bring some EDK, bring cure paralysis, Otherwise, bring Hell and Megid, your other abilities really honestly don't matter. I know that feels bad to say that you, you know, the Force abilities don't matter, but honestly, they, they really don't matter. You can do some stacks on things like Lily and Rappy, and you can lock down Lily in single player with damage as opposed to just multiplayer lockdown. 
But, uh, yeah, you shouldn't be using text for the most part here, sadly. Let's talk about, uh, I guess boss tips. So this boss is probably the glitchiest boss that you'll fight in PSO. It, it like, loves to glitch whether or not it's in front or to the right. It's definitely not intended. If it is, it's very awkward with how it loads in. So it'll look like it's in front of you, but then it goes to the right and then back to the front. Or it'll just start in the front and then go left. I'll say the boss and sometimes the unhittable when, a, when next to the raft due to glitching underwater. Yeah, so there's sometimes it'll let you hit the boss more often on the side, sometimes it doesn't. It's, it's not a pattern, to my knowledge, it just seems like a bug. I don't know if they'll ever fix it, but it's really terrible when you get them going underwater early. But basically, it's just Worm Boss again. The gimmick of it is, instead of the, uh, orange rays using, uh, what's it called? Confuse. They paralyze now. So Cure Paralysis is recommended not only for the lilies, but also if you're doing the boss rush. So, the trick to dealing with them is to just know that they always spawn in the center of the raft. Let's say the Worm Boss goes out of view, and the, the pygmy, the little pig worms or whatever they're called, start big rays, I think, start spawning on the raft from, like, a furthest to closest range, the orange ones will always be in the middle. It's not going to be random, it's not like it's top, then bottom, then middle, it's always middle. So if you aim your guns there, in particular if you got a bazooka or maybe a guilty light so your shots don't get blocked, um, those will stop you from getting paralyzed. And don't forget, chat, enjoy the lineup Olympics to exit the raft as soon as possible, where essentially you're just looking for that one bolt. Go see any of the times we have done RT. <laughs> I could demo this, but I'm like, nah. <laughs> Go watch one of our, like, 50 RT videos. We do this all the time. It has become a staple in the past year and a half. Uh, let's see. What do forces need help with? Lily killing in multiplayer, Indie Belras, and Hilda Bears are probably the big threats. They're just, like, a little too tanky to be killed fast by a force. Forces can stunlock or kill, but usually can't do both on those targets. So, they'll do their best in assisting with Megid. So, for example, if they have a lot of things that boost their technique level, which is the only thing that matters with Megid, MST does not matter, um, aside from learning the tech, they will be able to kill a lot of grunt enemies very quickly. So, if they have a piercing Megid, which they either get by playing Faux Neural or by wearing certain items like Dirty Life Jacket or Super Endgame epic weapons like Demonic Fork, or Cursed Cloak, I think you could get it very hard as an example. So any one of those things can grant Piercing Megid to other characters, and it does greatly speed up the clear. If you're looking to optimize your solo force run, sadly it's going to be all about Piercing Megid. It's not going to be about boosting your tech damage like 90% of the time. The sorry players that wanted force to be good in episode 2. you can It's like barely playable in solo to completely unplayable in multiplayer. So anyway, I don't have anything else to really say here. Just observe the set damage. Funny enough, the set damage is actually lower from the hill delts in Temple compared to Forest. I don't know why that is. I wonder if that was a bug. Because the, uh, the Forest ones do 300 damage uh, in Solo, but they only do 220 in Solo Temple. Always thought that was interesting. That, that seemed like it was coded incorrectly, but you know. <laughs> Chat, whatever. But anyway, up next we have Spaceship. I don't have a lot of hints or tips to say here, sadly. A lot of these early areas eventually just devolve into hell everything. <laughs> Whatever you can't hell, you burst with ATP. So a lot of the Force tips are literally Megid or use ATP. So sorry, Forces. I don't recommend bringing spells here basically ever. Um, what do Forces struggle with? Barans and Sorcerers, as usual. So, not too much different here. The same advice kind of applies from episode 1, so I'm not really going to linger here. Uh, just be aware that the only real additional change is for the boss here, for the dragon. Uh, it does do different elemental breaths. i say the random elemental breath weapon. So if you have boss invincibility, you can just run through it. 
So this is probably where boss invincibility is really crucial here. It also lets you get away from when it stomps, but otherwise I don't think it behaves any differently compared to very hard. So we'll move forward to mountains, jungle, seaside, CCA. So technically they're all part of the central control area. Um, the reason I like to split it up is that I do feel like there are some runs that are very easy. Like jungle has like a lot of gibbons, mountains might also have like a bit of robots and gibbons, seaside has like guyguis. These are generally clearable, whereas CCA tends to focus on almost nothing but mini bosses. So if you're wondering why I split it both in some of the categories as well as uh, talking about that ATP MST breakdown, that's what my distinction is. CCA is usually the hardest of the hardest spawns, whereas things like jungle, you'll fight a lot of like marillas or like very easy plant monsters that anybody could deal with. So it could be deceptively easy in some areas. So to deal with the gimmicks of the enemies, I recommend at least 27 EDK, since Zolt Gibbons can now use a very weak Megid. Uh, Ult Gibbons constantly spam Gazans, so Cure Shock shuts them down really hard. And I would recommend that if you're starting off to try to avoid any quests with Murder Flowers. If you don't know what I mean by Murder Flowers, so we'll, we'll finally describe the term. The new gimmick is that the three elemental flowers, there's like the Miracle, the Merrick, Maricus, etc., those flowers. Instead of shooting elemental damage, which I thought was fair, and I feel like emphasized having good resistances across the board rather than just hard stacking one resistance, decided that, hmm, why don't we just have them shoot an unresistible, fast, instant death attack? I hate them, chat. <laughs> I hate them, chat. I hate them so much. These things are the absolute newbie killers. They'll even kill high level players because they don't care what your stats are. You're level 200 and your Hugh cast, oh, you didn't freeze trap three of them and you only freeze trap two, GG, you lose. Like these enemies are so dumb. Whereas I think the other areas are more playable and very hard, I really genuinely don't enjoy basically any quests with murder flowers and that has tainted a lot of my views on episode two because on top of not enjoying the tile sets there, um, I only really think maybe Mines has worse tile sets, to be honest. Uh, I do think some of the enemy combinations are just horrific with all the gimmicks combined. So unfortunately, due to this, uh, you just need raw damage. If you don't have raw damage and demons to deal with the mini bosses, which are Gibbles, uh, the big ape, Gaigui, which is the floating insect, and all the different murder flower variants, you are in for a very bad time. This is one of the areas you should probably be heavily geared for, but be aware that if you don't fight Murder Flowers, or you only fight Gibbles, or you only fight Gaigui, it's not as bad. A very minimal EDK is needed, and basically Rebarda to shut down enemies is probably fine. I'll make a note here. Rebarda and Stunlock shut down Gibbles. I think that's an important point to put here. Even if you're doing ATP with Force, that's probably one of the only times I will use a, a damaging spell for semi-intended purposes. But being able to freeze Gibbles is kind of huge. Uh, let me think. Are there any other tips I want to say here? No. Always focus the Murder Flowers. Murder Flowers can party wipe you super easy. Gibbles, if not frozen, can be a big problem to the party. He does a lot of damage and he can leap around. Um, be aware, I'm gonna say be aware that standing against walls prevents Gibbles from leaping at you most of the time. Put that little there. Then we're gonna go to my favorite boss section. Do not gel in Gal Griffin. I repeat, do not, do not gel in Gal Griffin. Please don't do this. Please don't do this. <laughs> this will lead to a party wipe. The Griffin has a charge move where it basically runs at you on the ground. And if you gel in it, it's one of the few attacks that looks like it's set damage, but it is not. And when you gel in it, it will result in it hitting you like 12 times and you die. You don't mind if I do, pretty much. Be aware that Zalor can hit deceptively high on the boss, 
So if you choose not to move from the start and wait for the initial wing sweep of the boss, Zillor level 20 can reach the boss very easily. I think Zillor 15, if time well, can also do it. But Zillor 30 and above, or 25 and above, can very easily hit the Gal Griffin as it swoops by. So it's, it's pretty much fine to Zalore the boss, and this is one of the ones you should really, really, really Zalore. Because I think some people don't realize you can Zalore it that high in the air. Because, again, it is pretty high up in the air, but it doesn't matter. Zalore doesn't care about that for the most part. Uh, be aware that the little plant creatures, Marillas and Merlitas, can take damage from Gafoe stacking. So if you have a couple Gafoe's waiting, if it hits them while they're in the ground... They're not going to take any damage. But if they're in between, they're like going from rooted to standing. They do take additional Gafoe damage. However, just me get them. Me get me get me get me get me get chat. <laughs> You're going to have trouble with Soul Gibbons. Soul Gibbons. Sinos. It's just bad. It's just, it's really bad, chat. I'm telling you, this, this is the, when you go to, like, high-end CCA, this is what we call the no-fun zone. When you're fighting, like, a cross-formation of murder flowers, they're like, oh, do you not have everybody in perfect position to freeze-trap them? Or are you not playing, uh, perfect resond in order to deal with them? Perish. <laughs> There's just nothing else. You're done. There's no counterplay. Uh, Seabed's kind of an interesting thing where there are some quests that are surprisingly easy, but actually full clearing Seabed is kind of miserable. So again, Hell Weapons work well here as well. You need ATP for the non-hellable targets, and basically everybody should be running Demons, that's not a cast. If you thought you were doing spell damage, you should know better. <laughs> the the game designer decided to not let you basically do any damage here, so I don't recommend ever coming here unless you're fully kitted out with ATP. But this is like the end game of end game areas, the full clear. Weirdly enough, I don't think the boss is too bad. It, there's like kind of a, a threshold of boss is hard to boss is super easy, and it purely just depends on your raw ATP stats. So what people what people usually do is by the time they go to fight the boss, they save up Mila Eula or the twin special from their mag in order to get a Chain Blast, so they potentially could get like level 79, level 81, Shift Icky Band, and then the boss melts. And as long as you don't die, you carry it into phase 2 and the boss then dies again. So this is probably one of the, the few bosses where it's very meta to have a mag that is able to do those mag blasts. So just be aware that that's important to do. Otherwise, I, I mean at this point it feels a little redundant. Forces need help with everything. <laughs> Honestly, they the only thing they can, can kill easily are the things that you can kill easily with hell. So like, um, basically everything that is not Del Beater, Del Deaths, or Sinozoa can be handled by the Force, or by a Ranger, or by a Hunter with hell weapons. Del Deaths are kind of their own special hell, I would say. They are one of the highest evading enemies in the game. So if you do not have a freeze trap or ability to freeze them instantly, even Frozen Shooter without hit will miss a lot of the times, unless you are like literally max ATA on a lot of these rangers. Uh, they're basically unt untouchable murder discs that will wipe your party. It's not really, not really too much else to say. They just absolutely dumpster you. Speaking of which, let's make sure to record the level of Migid for them. They do shoot out Migid. I want to see, did I put that in there? Don't see it here. I'll put it up here. We'll say... EDK of 60, I believe the number is 63 in solo versus 84. So they have a higher requirement to survive the hell. But it is worth bringing to some extent. I'm sure I get the format there correctly. Good. 
I'll use the same verbiage I did here. So the big difference with, uh, I'd say seabed to some of the other harder areas of the game is that at least there's some things you can hell here. So there are runs you could do. We talked about Phantasmal World 3, which actually takes place in seabed. Uh, due to the fact that you're only really going against very low end resistances, it's not too bad. So what I mean by that is that if you have at least like an 80% chance of hitting hell, which is both standard hell weapons and or a moderate level beacon, you'll probably kill most enemies in two to three shots of your attempted thing, as long as you're able to land the hit in the first place. That's not too bad. I do want to remind you that to stop the Del Beaters from charging, you can use uh, Gafoe either from Hunter, Ramar, etc. It doesn't matter what level Gafoe. In fact, lower level Gafoe is preferred. Uh, worth from things like Twin Blaze or Americus Rod will prevent the Del Beaters or basically the charging horn dog things that shoot lasers from smacking into you, which is always kind of nice. The other trick that I'm not sure players know about is that if you physically aim your camera away from the Morphos or the butterfly enemies, uh, they cannot shoot their lasers and they can't fire at you. This is one of the few enemies that actually cares about how your camera is positioned. But those are kind of little fun tricks to help you clear a seabed. That helps in particular with uh, Phantasmal Roll 3, knowing that if you just don't have them in sight, they can't hit you. Now we're going to include the saddest fact we've ever had. Humar Zalor does not reach Oga Flow until, until after it moves to attack. It's so sad, Chad. That's some- that is some straight-up hate on poor Humar. I don't know why his ability can't reach, why they couldn't just let the boss get a little closer than what it was. So sad. Otherwise, yeah, big F in the chat for Humars. Otherwise, like, again, same kind of tips here. Sadly, episode 2 has a lot of kind of samey information. I'm gonna try not to read out literally, like, line for line. Uh, also, this is not in the right section. Yeah, Del Beaters do uh, 720 damage, which is quite a lot. Okay, I put it in the right section down there. So just be aware that Del Beaters tend to be the reason why Seabed is done later, because if you don't have the right tools to freeze them and shut them down early, they could just completely party wipe you between the laser shots and everything else. It's kind of crazy, honestly. In fact, I'm going to make sure I'm not missing set damage from them. Oh, you know what's interesting, Chad? I have the Del Beater damage here, but it's not on the wiki. And Chad quickly fact-checked me on how much damage it does there. I would appreciate that. We'll move forward for now. I think I looked at an old list to get this value, but it's actually surprisingly not on the wiki. But anyway, now we have Tower, probably the most infamous part of episode 2. Um, don't, don't do this until you are like completely endgame geared, or like trying to get a very specific item with really good gear. There are so many enemies that insta-kill you, there are so many enemies that just do raw ATP, there are so many enemies that could just instantly reduce your health to basically zero through flat elemental damage or just ludicrous ludicrous overall damage it, it's kind of upsetting honestly how much damage those things do oh boy chat what, where do we even go with those I don't even know what to say I guess we'll start with the gimmicks. Well, murder flowers are back, so have fun with that. I think all but two enemies in tower have an insta-kill of some effect. So Ilgil is insta-kill, the Del Lily is insta-kill, Del Beater does not, Gibble does not, Gaigui does not. Every other flower in there, including Del Lily, is me good. It's it's pretty miserable. So if you do not have a lot of crowd control at this point um, and damage, you're just not getting through it. Ilgils have hilariously high defense. It's Epsilon. Yeah. Nope, still spelled it wrong. I'll get it there eventually. Have such high defense. 
that it is not worth attacking them with anything other than demons plus the lore. I'm gonna draw special attention to those. Epsilon has the highest defense in the game to my knowledge. Ilgils are pretty close. They're only really competing with episode one pan arms. That's how tanky they are. And those two enemies combined equal a total pain in the butt for low ATP characters. So if you're coming in, you're like, oh, I got like a thousand ATP. I can handle them. Wrong. <laughs> you better hope you have some high-end Zalore and, and way higher ATP because you are not damaging them at all for sure. It is so miserable, Chad. Do not go into battle uh, against them with anything other than those options. So... What do forces need help with? Everything. This is their worst area. Please don't. Please don't expect a force to go here and do anything other than debuff. <laughs> like, they can maybe supply some demons. But on XL, you're just not dealing any damage. You're, it's true. It's true. You even need high-end weapons to even hurt them. You're like, oh, I'm like 1200 with like mech guns. Nah, you're still not doing damage. You didn't Zalora, GG. You're doing like literally five a shot or something dumb. Yeah, also remember against Ilgils as well as Murder Flowers, Rebarda is your friend. Believe in the power of Rebarda to interrupt the Ilgils. They're kind of like Del Sabers in that sense where you can kind of loop them. Murder Flowers can also be looped to some extent. So even low level Rebarda is better than nothing versus them. So, as a reminder, Chad, if you did get to this point as a force, I'm so sorry. We have a moment of silence for everybody that tried to solo force and tower. Big moment of silence for everybody that tried that in ultimate difficulty. So, what do you need to survive? Well, Epsilon does a hilarious 1465 fire damage for some reason. Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. So, if you don't have really high fire resist and HP units, and battle units, and accuracy units, you are not doing anything. Just don't even, like, you, you're just not gonna do anything. Resta doesn't even matter because most things either reduce you to one or kill you, and there's almost no in between. We're seeing to be around level 280, it feels like that. Um, the only thing you're really doing is maybe Panic Rebardas or Panic Razans to stunlock uh, Lilies, prevent them from shooting you or Murder Flowers from shooting you. You are never going to damage them with techs. You, you deal, like, sometimes a pitiful two digits of damage against, like, a 5k, 6k health enemy. Like, you are just straight up not doing anything in multiplayer. It is miserable. I cannot understate how unfun this is as force. Is if people were thinking they could just spell blast all the way through, this is, like, the rudest wake-up call slash awakening you could have for that. It's like, oh, you didn't bring ATP, GG. <laughs> <laughs> Just, it's actually over. It's not even clearable. It's over. Um, yeah, so we're, we're out of episode 2, fortunately. So we're almost up to our break, chat. I promise. We're close. So episode 4 tips. Uh, forces love this episode. The only real downside to episode 4 in general for forces is just getting a little bit of extra HP, which you could very easily get from hit point units. Uh, which drop in early areas like caves, forests, as well as crater. And honestly, just defense. If you get a little bit of both, you don't even need like endgame armor, just like something in between. Even wearing like secret gear, funny enough, works in some areas. Uh, you'll basically just kind of stomp everything. Murphy says you receive one kill mini boss, mini boss receives 5500 TP. I mean, you're not wrong. Episode 2 TP usage is egregious. So if you come here with the Faux Newman, this is like their playground. This is like one of the easiest things to do. Uh, a lot of people will make Faux Newmans, myself included, specifically to clear Episode 4. You basically ignore all the gimmicks that Episode 4 has when you play Ultimate, because you're playing Force. It's like, if you're not Gafoeing, you're Grancing. If you're not Grancing, you're Rebarding. If you have to, if they're not dead by then, it's probably a rare enemy and you need Resond or something dumb. Like, that's, that's the chain. You'll refoe gafoe everything. So, if you do a lot of fire focus here, it's just, it's so ridiculously good. Giving his forces and now some are useful other than forest, yeah. I actually, Murphy, I think they're actually good at caves. But it depends on the caves quest. 
I actually think they do out outspeed. I'll give a I'll give an easy example where I think they are the best character class for it. Christmas Fiasco One Lily resets. They're number one. I wouldn't play any other character other than them. You need to kill six lilies or seven lilies in between waves. Stack the Foley into Razan. GG. So fast. But again, situational. Uh, let's see. B -b -b also solo only. Multiplayer it gets noticeably worse. Because sadly, uh, what they like to do in these episodes is they like to swap uh, Ice and Lightning Resist. So you should probably check as you play what damage they actually take. Lilies are a great example where they swap between being weak against Lightning and Solo, which is amazing, to Ice, which sounds like it's good because Rabarda is strong, but then you lose your full room clear. So a lot of rooms just become not unplayable, but they become really unsafe comparatively if you've just been allowed to use Razan, which is a shame. Uh, for melee characters coming here, uh, what I would say is that while forces are able to easily pop all the crystal cores, you're gonna need something to consistently hit them. So you need like a slicer, a bazooka, uh, divine punishment from Heaven Striker, preferred of course. You'll need melee weapons if you're fighting lizards, and honestly Gorons as well. I find melee weapons are super, super good to bring against them. You'll need guns versus the Goron detonators because their range is just too far, and the flying birds. So there's a lot of weapons you have to bring, and that's why I considered for ATP, it's more of a middle game thing. Like, you'll get all your basics in like forests and maybe caves, and then once you have those, maybe you'll do crater, or you might do a little bit of solo mines first, because you'll only need like one weapon type to clear, where uh, episode 4 does require quite a bit. So there are weapons you can get, we mentioned Frozen Shooter before, Guilty Light a really great pickup and very hard. Again, please look up the proper guide for this, because we talked about that item to a very large extent in the proper guide. Uh, but be aware that as you get access to more and more weapons, the Ranger and the Hunter start to pull ahead. I don't think there's runs that they, like, instantly outpace the, the Force, but the Force just has, like, a general scaling, beautiful moment where all they need is MST, all they need are fire boosts, and you'll get a couple of the other elemental boosts, like, for example, the boss cores might be weak to ice or lightning, so you'll, you'll bring elemental staffs to cover those when you go there. But like 95% of the time, you will be spamming Gafoe or Rafoe. And like literally nothing else as you let everybody else take everything over. So let's talk about things that potentially you need uh, to begin in Crater. So I would recommend if you're a beginner player, I think a Rest and Seize versus the Dwarfons or the Charging... Not quite Elephants. Kind of like Rhinos, I guess. Uh, shutting them down with uh, status ailments is really strong with them. Uh, if you have lower ATP, I feel demons is higher priority for versus Dwarfons. <laughs> but apparently it wants to call them dolphins, not quite. Uh, but essentially, as you get higher in ATP, you could go back to like your single target double sabers or your Vulcans or whatever. But demons early on is very useful for climbing uh, early crater. And you basically need a melee weapon versus satellite lizards. Slash Yawis. The reason being that uh, they block all projectiles from the front, as a reminder for people that haven't played it before. And generally, zoos will never be in melee range. You would have to stop their dive bomb at, like, literally the bottom of the dive bomb to really consistently melee with them. And it's just better to mech gun or, or handgun them in that scenario. So, what are fast clears like in Crater? Well, this is probably the first time I've talked about this, so we'll very briefly, I guess, open up this weapon. But there's something known as Heaven Striker. This is kind of the other, like, game-warping powerful item that exists that rangers can get, and there's, like, a specific thing that they can set up for us. So let me hide the guide for a moment. Oh, we'll leave up this stat. Oh, that's not the right one. Weapon, one second. So the way Heaven Striker works is if you combine it with a mag called the Striker Unit, what you're able to do... Oops. On the go. What you're able to do is essentially shoot lasers like Falls uses on you. And what that means is that these particular things are super, super good at defeating all the enemies because 
Most enemies in Episode 4 have a weakness to light damage. So not only are you, you pew pew lasering, which don't care about the lizard's uh, resistance to projectiles, but on top of that, you're just kind of going through and hitting almost everything's weakness. There's a couple enemies that do resist this, but just be aware that if you're thinking about potentially soloing as a ranger uh, versus multiplayer, I do feel like Ramarl gets a pretty big boost here. Ramar is also semi-solid with it, since both of them can take advantage of the fact that uh, your own MST improves the damage of the Heaven Striker lasers. Otherwise, I feel like in multiplayer, they're not as needed. I feel like with proper supports of forces, uh, rangers and hunters could do extremely well here. There's enough gimmicks where there's reasons to use some classes over others, but usually it just ends up being a I'm either Hugh Cast or Raw Cast and I delete everything kind of scenario. But be aware there's a, a lot more, I would say, party diversity in this area compared to some of the other ones. So I just wanted to bring this one up. We'll, we'll go over this in more detail. Sadly, you can only get this in uh, by doing Episode 4. So, or, or technically, I guess they introduced it in Seabed, which I don't think you would do Seabed for it, or Ruins, which again, I would not recommend to do. But anyway, let's go back to the gun. We'll leave Heaven Striker up just for the chat, though, for your reference. So essentially, there are whole parties of people that get together on even beat because that's when the special works. Don't ask me why, that's just how they programmed it. Or you do Oops All Forces, which is probably one of the only times you'll hear me say that as a fast clear. Or you'll have at least one person as a force using a Foey stacking. Or that person will be taken a place of with a Heaven Striker unit. So there will be people of like four raw Marls with Heaven Strikers or some raw Mars. Or there will be four forces, or there'll be like two forces and two ATP, but one might be raw Marl. Um, you'll, you'll see some pretty crazy combos. And honestly, I really like the party diversity in Episode 4. I'm a big fan of Episode 4, so I will always promote it. Um, but I do think as you get higher in level, most of the mechanics are pretty fair. Unlike Episode 2. So, let's talk about, like, the primary paralysis targets. You can, you can paralyze Astark and Buddhas as you're starting off. It's, it's not bad to do. So you have some use of things, like if you picked up Kunai in Episode 4, or happen to trade for other items that get Paralysis. Most enemies are susceptible to Paralysis, but the one that you need to be shutting down are probably the Dwarfons. You can also shut down the Astarks if you don't have enough raw ATP to burst them. It's not necessarily a thing. Like, if you're a high-level Hue cast, you're not going to be paralyzing Astark. You're going to be deleting the Astark. Uh, but for things like the Dwarfons, being able to shut down, like, three or four of them so that your force can stack a foey or or use grants or use regular foey or for your rangers and hunters to use their charge weapons it's just so good so this is probably one of the big areas where i i end up using uh status ailments a lot more because i think the big issue with some of the earlier episodes is enemies just don't have enough hp and defense to really justify using it most of the time like yes you can do that in forests to some extent and yes you can do it in caves to some extent but, like, is it as impactful as shutting down, like, the long-reaching Astark or, like, the Dwarf on charge? No. So, let's talk about, uh, what you need to focus on if you're playing the Surface of Episode 4. I, I said Surface. If you see Surface in there, I will try to correct it. Just let me know. It's called Crater. I always call it Surface. It's technically Crater. But essentially, from the Surface slash Crater portions of Episode 4, you basically are just focusing high hit point targets and the one enemy that cannot be killed with fire, which is the Babuda. The way to recognize the Babuda for people that don't play a lot of Episode 4 is if he raises his hand and a fireball comes out, kill it with fire. Only not literally, because he resists fire. Please kill Babudas. Babudas are the four slayers. Please do not let them attack. If there's enough of them, like sometimes there's waves of like four to eight, uh, on the upper end of those waves, you could be absolutely locked out of combat with constant Kofoe spam. It's actually insane how bad that is for players. It's still sort of fair. You could get out of it, but it's it's brutal. As a reminder, uh, Zoot dive bombs are kind of hard for hunters to deal with. This is kind of like the ranger's job to kind of step in. Uh, if you have Kofoe, great, you could stop them from dive bombing. Otherwise, if you have a ranged weapon that can hit in the air, like Guilty Light, Frozen Shooter, uh, you can hit them regardless of your angle to the zoo. 
if the zoo is directly die bombing you, you can instead hit them with a ray gun or a mech gun. But if you try to shoot them from a diagonal or from the side, you're probably going to whiff without using one of the, these kinds of items. Uh, also be aware that satellite lizards slash yaoi's, aka the small armor-plated uh, lizards, block all projectiles from the front. You can confuse trap them in order for them to fight each other and expose their backs to you. So for whatever reason you did forget a melee weapon, there are ways around it, including being able to freeze them once their back is turned, being able to paralyze them from there. Otherwise, just bring melee. Uh, fire traps work on a lot of enemies here as well. So use them to keep your combo safe. Spam them constantly. It's hilarious. It is funny. You can even use them on Rappies as they descend from the skies by timing the fire trap. Like, the fire traps are actually very, very strong in episode 4 for damage purposes as opposed to gimmick purposes. Um, otherwise, if you're a force, bring enough HP units to survive the set damage, which is more relevant in multiplayer since Dorfon does 720 damage, which is pretty high in multiplayer, but only 468 in single player, which is honestly not that bad. And that's why I think they could get away with going here early. Because like 500 is kind of like mid game-ish. Like you're starting to enter mid game territory without any HP materials, but like, one or two heavenly HPs, you should be at, like, 600 plus with every force. Even the phone roll. Or phone roll. But generally speaking, if you're not sure what to do, when in doubt, go foey out, chat. This spell will defeat 80% of the enemy types. Most of the enemies take either full damage on spawn or partial damage on spawn. And they get absolutely wrecked. So... Being able to clear out potentially three enemies completely just by stacking one spell and other enemies with them will take repeated damage and be completely shut out of combat without you needing to switch spells is insane. So fire is absolute king here. I recommend as many fire boosts as you can in Crater. And finally, chat, we're, we're at underground. So the only real problem I would say with underground are two things. Goron Detonator, Gurdabulu. So... I honestly don't think Gorons are a big issue for forces. Jelenning them reduces their damage pretty heavily. Uh, zoos are zoos. Zoos are shut down pretty hard by them. Marissas can be bad, but forces don't care about them. It's more the raw ATP of Goron Detonator, and it's more the elemental damage of Gurdabulu that'll end up killing forces. So if you do quests that have low numbers of them, honestly, I think this is even easier than uh, pretty much every option outside. Like, if you're doing, like, forests, then caves, then um, crater, then temple, honestly, underground is almost right after that for me in solo play. If you're not doing a quest with a lot of Goron Detonators or Gurdabulus, because there's a lot of quests that don't have Gurdabulus, or they have a single Gurdabulu, which is not a problem. Uh, Goron Detonators, though, they do a lot of damage. You have to respect them. So it's recommended you have 800 plus health, not because of set damage necessarily, but just because of the high damage the Grunt Detonator can do. Gurdabulus can also double hit you, because they have the ability to freeze you, which does a lot of damage. And if you're planning on doing a boss, you need a little more than 800 damage. Or 800 HP, I mean. But you'd be surprised how low HP you could get into here without uh, dying, honestly. You could, you, could, you could end up with less HP in mines. Or about the same HP you'd use to survive mines without being uh, knocked down, and they would be appropriate here. So, like, what are the fast clears here? Usually having at least one force, if not all forces. And if they're doing oops all forces, at least one person has demons versus Goron Detonator and Gurdabulu. So Gurdabulu has a lot of health and doesn't take a lot of spell damage. It... Well, it takes okay spell damage, let me correct that statement, but it has too much health in multiplayer. So being able to do, like, your grants might be doing, like, somewhere between 400 and 800, which is not low by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, the problem is the thing will have a ton of health in multiplayer, so it would t potentially take you somewhere in the ballpark of, like, 12 to 15 clears, which is... It's not great. I don't recommend it. Let me get their exact HP total. Yeah, they're... So, like... Okay, so without Anguish, they have about 4,600, which isn't too bad. In single player, though, their health is pretty low. So they technically get dumpstered by Grants pretty quickly. 
but against... But against Gerdabulu on the other... Oh, sorry. I was looking at the wrong difficulty. Correction. They have 7,681 health in single player in ultimate, which is decently high, but they only have 20 light resist, so you'll be doing basically full grants damage. The problem is that in multiplayer, it's 17,000 health. So if it was just 10,000 health, I would say arguably you might not need demons, but with that much raw HP, it's recommended you demon them. And they don't really have great evade either, so they're not like super crazy hard to hit, even though they're in like what would be considered an endgame area. So most characters should have an option in order to demon them. In fact, there's a very popular item which we'll go over when we talk about Underground again in the next section, uh, called Slicer of Fanatic, which let me pop that up for the chat. Put that away. So essentially what we're looking to do with this is... We can get it in technically in very hard mode. I think we mentioned it very briefly in Popper. But the fact that uh, we have this ability to multi-target demons that's unreduced means that the three-part Gerdabulu potentially get hit three times, which means almost every single time you throw it and your hit percentage is high enough, or you do the SN accuracy glitch, which is also mentioned in the wiki, which as a reminder from Popper means if you throw a special attack, and then you normal before the special lands. The special will take the normal accuracy of the second attack to calculate whether it hits. It makes it way easier to use these things. But anyway, long story short, Slicer Fanatic is like the one of the end-all be-all items, but honestly, basically any demons is good for that reason. Let me put that away. Leave up the little Slicer Fanatic mini thing in the corner though. So it's recommended that you bring at least that. Um, in or if you do find yourself not quite at max accuracy, it can help to paralyze the Gerdabulu, since paralysis does reduce the evasion of the enemy, and that is more of an issue in multiplayer than I would say single player. Uh, so just be around, just be aware that you could do that. Also, Rappies get shut down really hard by paralysis. They don't have really good status resist in general, so confuse and paralysis kind of shut them down super quick. I would recommend against Marissa specifically as well as uh, Gorons to kind of be careful about using things like Paralysis and Freeze. The reason I... S well, more, more, more Paralysis than Freeze, I would say. Just be careful if the Marissa is jumping or the Gorons are teleporting, because it's possible to clip them and they'll try to teleport away as a reaction to your attack, and this will cause them to be untargetable, possibly also to you. So most people will bring in a lot of Freeze for it, but I also find that if you just melee with it instead of using ranged alternatives, you can still paralyze them without usually having that drawback, since the Gorons are kind of designed to punish uh, ranged attacks. So, actually, I should probably write that. Oh no, I, I did write that. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. So, basically, uh, all Gorons will try to teleport if you hit them with a ranged shot, except from spells. I'm going to say except from Teps. So just be aware, you can force them to get closer to you by shooting them repeatedly, which may or may not be a great thing. But anyway, I think we covered most of the basic enemies, so let's talk about the boss briefly. Uh, basically, the spinner location, it, it kind of mimics falls in such a way where it starts off with spinners, except there are certain color spinners, red, orange, and yellow, that depending on which one you defeat buys you additional time to hit the boss's cores to leave the phase one, I'll call it, I guess. And essentially, once you get out of the phase one, it will always spawn on the right. Make a note here. Boss always goes to right chamber first. So basically, if you hug the wall while entering the chamber, you're gonna dodge tornadoes, you're gonna dodge most of the missile attacks. Most of the time, it should be fine. Knowing this, you could get rid of a lot of the things that will potentially kill you. And then, funny enough, this is another series of bosses, since Episode 4 technically is three bosses. But all three bosses are really weak to Estella, aka the Dolphin Mag Blast. A lot of people will basically save up their meter for this rather than Mila Eula, depending on how long the run is, in order to one-shot the cores. So normally, if you pop the cores out of order, 
what will happen is that it will leave the it'll leave the right chamber for example and go back to the main chamber and you have to pop all those ones there in one shot or else then it goes to another chamber at random so what people end up doing is finding a way to consistently deal damage to all the cores and the best way to do that is not to hit it with melee weapons or ranged weapons in fact it's pretty much impossible to hit with melee weapons um so if you're really desperate you can use slicer but preferably you'll be using things like rebarda or razan depending on the weakness of the boss or you'll do pew pew laser because pew pew laser is set damage so like it, if it's if it's gonna do 400 damage after resist excuse me it does light damage but that damage is static it's not critical is what i meant to say with that so if you know that you have one of the characters that is able to do that kind of static damage with no crit variance it is preferred versus the boss here and that's why i think forces have a really big advantage here because they just naturally have all they need to clear rooms and the boss without really changing much at all so if you're not the person going out and clearing the cores when it goes into the side chamber my recommendation is if you think of the central room as a clock you stand at approximately five o'clock in order to try to hit the final cores of the boss so you can help fix it so for example if it's missed if the player popped two out of four cores in the other chamber, you try to pop two out of four while they're in the central chamber and fix it. Or, if all four were popped when it was in the right chamber, then you just have one core left and you beat the boss. So you'll see basically a whole bunch of people gather, usually the hunters, since they don't have a lot of options to deal with the boss with uh, non-variable damage. And they'll do that to kind of speed things up. Hopefully those tips help. Gonna skip that song as says Lyra. But yeah, tips here won't really be any different. Uh, fire is the absolute ruler of this episode, and underground is no exception. Is no exception. Also, as a reminder, even if the enemies can be killed a little faster with Rebarda and Resond, eighty percent of the time it's usually just better to keep gefoing. Most of the time what'll happen is, the rule of thumb is if you don't know a quest, if an enemy seems really annoying to kill with Gafoe, 90% of the time, maybe even more, afterwards, the next set of enemies will be weak to Gafoe. So, if you're playing with a group, it's better to let the group kind of finish it off and then Gafoe afterwards to get a head start on the other wave than it is to do like 200 damage with Rebarda and save a couple seconds. You clearing the other wave or the next wave is more important. So for forces, this is probably the most intense spawn knowledge kind of checks you will come across. So knowing whether or not the next wave will spawn something that is weak to Gafoe, or if it's the final wave in the room, for example, and you need to move on, changes how you approach things, and you can really optimize it by just playing the same quest a few times and figuring it out. Now be aware that uh, Grants can kill the Gerdabulu in solo and multiplayer. Spell that. But unfortunately, Grants is not really great against Zeus. Zeus are technically weak against ice. They take partial damage from fire. And Grants is technically their weakness. However, if you're playing with a strong party, because Grants is so slow, you might get at most one, usually zero, Grants on a target that is being hard focused by your hunter and ranger friends before the grants go comes out. So again, this is just kind of a reminder to really focus on fire damage. You really don't want to be doing anything other than Gafoe unless you are absolutely forced to. Like, you have to debuff a Gordon de Detonator room, or you have to Zalora Gurdabulu because you have to be able to ATP kill it with your party. But otherwise, you have Rappies, Lizards, Goron, Zeus. Uh, it's just kind of crazy. I wrote Dwarf on Charge here, they don't exist in Underground. But Zoos do. And Gafoe stops the Zoo Dive Bombs, which is kind of nice. So I think with that chat, we finally completed... I guess our main portion of the intro tips. So hopefully this gave you a little bit of an understanding of the item meta. Because we are going to cover a whole bunch of items, including uh, some well-known things uh, as special notes and all the way down to every single area. No, we're not going to cover every item when we get there. It's just the important ones. So with that chat, we're going to go on a little break, but I think we could say goodbye to YouTube here since this will be very cleanly its own part. So that we're going to say, I guess, thank you for watching YouTube and see you again in the next part.